Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing before the Committee on Criminal Justice. At this time, please silence all electronic devices. No one may approach the dais at any time during today's hearing. Chair, you may begin. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Council Member Sandy Nurse, Chair of the Committee's uh, the Council's Committee on Criminal Justice. I'd like to welcome you to today's oversight hearing on preventing and addressing sexual assault and harassment in city jails, where we will also consider Intro 830, sponsored by Council Member Lewis. Up front, I'd like to note that throughout today's hearing, we will be discussing sexual violence. This topic is disturbing and may be difficult for some people, so please take care of yourself. I wanna recognize my colleagues who are here. Council Member Marte, thank you for being here. Sadly, this is not the first time this committee has focused on the issue of sexual abuse at Rikers Island. The inability to keep staff members, visitors, and people in custody safe from predatory behavior is a perpetual problem for the Department of Correction. In 2018, when the council held a hearing on this exact to topic, the department testified about efforts underway to bring itself into compliance with the Prison Rape Elimination Act by training staff, revamping its investigation process, and screening people in custody for risk of sexual victimization. Here we are, six years later, to demand action yet again because the Department of Correction must do more than simply claim they have a zero tolerance policy for sexual abuse and sexual harassment. These words must mean something. Sexual assault and harassment is a horrific, pervasive issue with dire consequences, and jails present a unique context for sexual abuse to occur. The insular environment, restrictions on incarcerated individuals' movement, and the inherent power structures in jails contribute to increased opportunities for sexual violence. In the community, sexual assaults are severely underreported compared to other crimes. This sad reality is even worse in correctional institutions where staff and other incarcerated people can target and further abuse people who report incidents. Even with this underreporting, people in custody filed 1,440 grievances to the Department of Correction related to sexual abuse and harassment last year. The Department of Correction has robust policies in place to prevent and address sexual abuse and harassment against people in custody. However, there appears to be a division between the department's written policies and the reality for those in its care. Thanks to individuals who came forward after the New York State passed the Adult Survivors Act, we now have a better understanding of how pervasive this issue is at Rikers Island. According to reporting by Jesse Edwards and Samantha Max at Gothamist, of the more than 1,200 cases filed under the ASA in New York City's Supreme, uh, uh, state Supreme Courts, nearly 60% of claims were filed against the City of New York and the Department of Correction. While many of these claims date back decades, Gothamist's investigation found 40 lawsuits contain allegations of sexual abuse at Rikers Island that occurred since 2018, the year we held our previous oversight hearing where DOC vowed that they were undertaking extensive reform efforts. Today, I hope the department will not deflect responsibility and will acknowledge that more needs to be done to end sexual abuse at Rikers Island. We owe it not only to the people in custody, but also to the staff at Rikers Island who are victimized and traumatized and deserve a workplace where they feel safe. To further our goals today, we are also considering legislation introduced by <coughs> Council Member Lewis to require DOC to develop a comprehensive training program for investigations of sexual crimes. Effective investigations are the foundations of accountability. I'm a, a proud co-sponsor of this important legislation requiring DOC to implement a victim-centered sexual crimes investigation training program. And uh, perhaps Councilmember Lewis will join to uh, share more about her bill. Um, but today we're gonna hear I'm sorry, we're also hearing Intro 792 from Councilmember Rivera, who will be here in, in a little bit and can speak on her bill. Today we're gonna hear, we're gonna start out our, our hearing um, with a panel of witnesses 
some individuals who have asked to, to speak and come forward and share their stories. We're gonna hear from Karen Kleins, Tasha Carter Beasley, Donna Hilton, and Sitan Sacco. I'm sorry if I'm messing up your name. So you all can start in whichever order you want. Take your time. You may begin when you're ready. And make sure the, the red light is on there in the microphone. Grand Rising members of the City Council, my name is Karen Kleins. Before I start, I would like to say the level of pain doesn't leave in the morning, okay? So I wrote this, I stand before you today as a survivor of sexual abuse while incarcerated. My story is not unique. It is one of hundreds, if not thousands of women who have survived similar fate. I have come forward with my truth, seeking justice and accountability. Yet despite our courage and the overwhelming evidence, the abusers remain unpunished. Why is it that those who have committed such horrific crimes against us are not held accountable? Why are they not subject to the same legal consequences as anyone else who have committed a crime? We are not asking for special treatment. We are asking for justice. We are asking for the same rights and protection that every citizen is entitled to. My voice has not been silenced. When I spoke up, I was punished and removed from general population. The mental trauma from the abuse and the subject punishment has been devastating. I have flashbacks and feelings of unsafety, unsecure at times. I don't know who to trust, doctors, psychiatrists, police, or therapists. It is time for the system to listen, to act, and to hold these abusers accountable. All of the survivors deserve justice. We deserve to see those who wronged us face the consequences of their action. We deserve to feel safe and to know that our suffering has not been in vain. And I wanna thank you for being here today and I thank you for allowing me the opportunity for my voice to be heard without punishment. Good morning to the City Council. My name is Tasha Carter Beasley. I am also formerly incarcerated in Rikers Island in 1996. Um, when I went into Rikers Island, I was a mother of eight children. At that time, I was suffering from mental illness. Um, drug addiction, and a slew of other things that you can imagine that would cause you to go to, to jail. And um, in jail and in my incarceration, I never was safe. I never really had the opportunity to reach out to my family to let them know what was happening to me inside. Um, how I got here today is amazing because I had to rebuild my life that was shattered. I didn't know how to do that. 
I didn't have any places to go after I was incarcerated. I didn't have any opportunity to help me understand that if I spoke up for myself that I would be safe, that I would be heard, that I would not suffer my past to define who I am presently. I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I have suffered a lot of shame behind the things that have happened inside of Rikers Island to me. I can't take back that time, but I relive it every day. I really didn't even know how um, to answer my granddaughter, 16 years old, and um, she read the news article. She's 16 years old, she's in high school. She's getting ready to go to NYU. And she asked me, she said, Grandma, what happened to you in there? And I didn't, I didn't know what to tell her but the truth. I couldn't help but to think that by any chance or anything that would happen to her that she would go through those stores and, and suffer that same fate or maybe in school or maybe anywhere in the neighborhood and not be able to effectively say what happened to me? I was um, manipulated. I was made to believe that I was at fault because I was um, not mentally healthy at the time. I was suffering from um, a lot of tribulations that started for me in Rikers Island. My life was better before. My life was better, even with being on drugs and in the street. It was like my life was better outside where I was able to at least run. At least I would be able to go somewhere and maybe hide myself, but inside of Rikers Island, I was never able to hide myself. I was subject to fear. I was subject to uh, house, uh, um, housing areas being because I spoke up because I told somebody and I told people over the telephone, I told other inmates, but none of that, none of that mattered. And when, and when you're inside of a place where you kind of feel like you're the fault of your own situation, it's kind of hard to really um, articulate that I need to speak up for myself. So I surrounded myself around other women that were my, my sisters and my peers that suffered the same things. So that's how I lived my life, life mostly in groups and settings of other women that needed healing and didn't have the tools. Because we didn't have the tools, we were marginalized women. No one can tell you how do you go and get healed from sexual abuse and sexual violence. How can I take the memories out of my mind how do I have a relationship with someone that is not an abuser? How do I know the difference? How can I trust myself if I can't discern that I'm in danger and I can't speak up? But um, let me go on to read. I had did write something and I'm here today to speak about the profound emotional trauma and the results of that sexual abuse. This trauma isn't a monetary affliction. It lingers. It affects every aspect of the survivor's life. It's the shadows that follow us. The stigma, the shame, the embarrassment, manifesting as anxiety and depression and the overwhelming sense of isolation. Survivors often struggle to trust again and to feel safe in their own bodies, in their environments. The emotional scars run deep. I can't stress that enough. The emotional scars, they run deep. <sighs> Impacting my relationships, my career, my overall well-being. This isn't something that we can overcome alone. Alone kept me isolated. 
Feeling alone made me want to kill myself. Feeling alone made me subject to more crime in my life. And as policymakers, I believe you have the ability to enact real change by providing resources for mental health, supporting and ensuring access to safe spaces. That's the biggest thing. Where do you go when you have been violently or seduced into a position that causes memories and causes flashbacks and causes every aspect of your life to be from that thing that happened to you. If these spaces are not created, then we have no healing. We need policies that's going to promote programs to prevent this. And we need help to rebuild our lives. Your support can transform our community into a place where survivors feel heard and validated. And that's a big thing. <sighs> I didn't feel validated for a long time. It took my children to forgive me for even being in that space. And still today, I have a lot of survivor's remorse. Still today, I can identify with my abusers. And sometimes, that makes me uncomfortable. Sometimes, <sighs> it's overbearing in a sense that I care whether you believe me or not. I care whether you want to hear me or not. I care that you know what it takes to stand here to tell you that things happen to me that I'm not happy about. And the Department of Corrections shouldn't be happy about it either. And um, I never thought I'd be here today though. I'm gonna tell y'all this. I never thought that when I did open my mouth and when I did that I would be this far today to put a face, to put feelings, to put a story, to put a narrative, to understanding why we have to be heard and why we have to be paid attention to. Because guess what? You got pictures of somebody's private part in you or in your mouth that you can't erase and it shouldn't have never happened, that's hard to live with. That's hard to walk with your head up. That's hard to say that this happened to me. I don't know sometimes whether to be angry. I don't know whether to run. It took me a lot to get here today. It did, it did. I didn't just wake up. I've been walking around with this inside of me whether, whether I was, I didn't, I. I wanted to stay to myself about it because I can't take no more of not listening, not being heard, not being violated. It's a sensitive situation. Of course, nobody wants to hear the dark side of what you can't see. And inside the jail, no one can see what was happening to us because we were secluded, isolated, controlled, the grieving system was not set up for us. It was not set up for us to feel so privy to go and write a grievance between, by the people who are holding keys to your incarceration. That's holding keys for your medication line, for your calls, for your visit, for commissary. It's a whole life inside. And I've seen that people, you're afraid to hear about the dark things that, oh, I don't know what they, I don't know how they can hide it any longer. So thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity to express just the shade of what, and, and, and my story is just, and I have not given you the ins and the outs because guess what, I'm tired. I'm tired of people not listening. I'm tired of people judging me. I'm tired that sometimes we don't even, don't even care if we get it no more because that's how deep trauma goes, that you will give up on it.
the very thing that you're fighting for and so many people and so many so much energy opposed to us being heard opposed to people being held accountable they didn't have no problem with putting me in jail and I went to jail for hurting myself. I was an addict. I was in jail for hurting myself. And I, was, I did the time for hurting myself. And at the same time, while I was incarcerated, they hurt me more. And that's when it began that my sorrows began. But today, I have to tell you, I'm far from that place that I want to see myself. I'm far from it. I'm not away from the memories. I'm not away from the trauma. I'm not away from the triggering. I'm not away from the fear of the opposite sex. I don't even know how to relate anymore. Okay, y'all. Thank you for letting me share and for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Okay. Good morning, members of the City Council. My name is Satan Sako, and I am here today to discuss the important issue of sexual violence in prisons. I was incarcerated at Rikers about eight years ago. My time at Rikers was eye-opening and extremely difficult. It forced me to confront the harsh realities of the justice system that most people don't see. During my time at Rikers, I experienced sexual harassment and was touched inappropriately by a staff member. It was an incredibly traumatic violation, especially because it happened in a place where I was supposed to be safe, at least from the people that worked there. This experience has had a lasting impact on me both emotionally and mentally and highlighted for me the importance of accountability within the justice system. The experience left me feeling powerless, knowing that someone who was supposed to protect and oversee my safety violated that trust. It took a heavy emotional toll, making it difficult to feel secure in an environment where I was already vulnerable. This incident underscored how important it is for staff to be held accountable for their actions. No one should ever have to feel unsafe in a place meant to ensure basic human rights regardless of their circumstances. When authority figures violate this, it signals a deep failure within the system. Experiencing abuse from a staff member showed me the urgent need for systematic changes to protect those in custody. Ensuring through, I'm oh, sorry, excuse me. Ensuring thorough training accountability and support for, for reporting these incidents is essential. No one should go through what I went through. The trauma from this experience is something I carry with me, affecting my mental health and my trust in others. It has been challenging to process and even more difficult to heal, but I'm determined to speak out so others don't have to experience the same. I'm sharing this because I want to be a part of the conversation around protecting vulnerable people in places like Rikers. By speaking up, I hope to bring attention to stricter accountability measures so that no one has to suffer in silence. Despite the fear and helplessness I felt, I refuse to let the, this experience define me. I'm working to reclaim my sense of safety and strength and I'm determined to stand up, not just for myself, but also for others who might be enduring similar situations. Thank you for this opportunity to share. Good morning. Just wanna say thank you for um, having us here again, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you know, I'm taking time to reflect as I hear my peers speak about their trauma, the situations that happened to them. And I'm sitting here 40, almost 40 years later from what happened to me on Rikers Island as an adolescent. So it's, it's painful, it's painful to have to hear this almost 40 years later that this, this trauma 
The trauma of abuse, sexual abuse, continues to permeate the very fabric of an island that we know should have long, long time ago been shut down. And it hurts me as a woman, as a mother, just as a human being to continue to hear these stories. It makes me look at my own as insignificant, but it's not. It's not, it's shameful, it's shameful. 40 years ago, I was on Rikers Island as an adolescent. I was placed into protective custody, a place within a very abnormal place that said it was more secure, more safe, more stable, that I would be protected. One of my protectors was a captain on Rikers Island. It was my first time being in the system, my first and only time. Let's be clear, because we hear these conversations, the rhetoric and the vitriol of those of us who are criminally justice impacted, who are worse than, less than, and not deserving of. Like because we have been impacted by the system, whether we do something or not, guilt or innocence should not be a factor, that we are not deserving, we are less than. And so why listen to us? Why care? Why bother? And that's wrong. A female captain who I thought was there to protect me and to guide me through the system that I knew nothing about as an adolescent, isolated, secluded from everyone because this label was placed on me to protect me as one of the youngest ones on the island. This woman took advantage of me, manipulated me into thinking that she was there to protect me, to make sure nothing happened to me. She did things that I don't even want to discuss. She did things that no captain who says that they take an oath to protect, to serve, to care, custody, control, we know the rhetoric, did not do, but instead violated that oath every single chance that she got. Who could I tell? Who could I turn to in protective custody? in a jail that was run by <laughs> officers, captains, sergeants, tenants, deps, you name it, wardens, that say that they're there to protect, to care, to maintain custody. I didn't see it. As a result, <laughs> as a result, her wife, who was a deputy, found out that she was, <laughs> I guess, favoring me too much. I went to court one morning at six o'clock in the morning. I came back at 10 o'clock at night, and I was then placed I was taken from the status of protective custody and now put into administrative segregation. And I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't understand the rules or the procedures. Again, it was my first time and my naivete spoke volumes. I was placed in administrative segregation because her wife, the deputy, and I'm going to say it because I even wrote about it and I speak about it, and I am not lying. We are not liars. Had someone place a shank that I didn't even know what a shank was in my cell when I left to go to court 
a shank that I still to this day, almost 40 years later, have not seen. And accused me of things that I had no understanding of, no knowledge of. I didn't, wouldn't even know how to do it. And as a result, I was placed into solitary confinement. Let's call it what it is. Solitary confinement, locked for 90 days for having something I never saw, accused of things I've never done, all because this deputy was angry with her wife, the captain, who was sexually assaulting a detainee, an adolescent de detainee on Rikers Island in protective custody. And I'm giving it to you in that way because that's how it happened and that's how it continues to happen. And we have these hearings, we meet, we talk, you listen, but as you said, Councilwoman Nurse, 2018, when we had that hearing, and here we are in 2024 having another one. And so you listen to us, you hear our stories, you hear our pain. You hear our trauma, we tell it over and 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 over again. When, when will we be heard? When will we be believed? No, we don't wear a uniform with stripes and medals and badges, but we wear something else. We wear our truths. We wear our trauma. We wear the abuse. We wear it every single day. I'm not even crying for me right now, I'm crying for them. Because 40 years ago, this happened to me. And 40 years later, I have to hear this young woman talk about what just happened to her. When will we see different? When will we be treated as human beings? regardless of guilt or innocence, being so-called career criminals, whatever these labels you want them to represent, you see through instead of seeing a human being and recognizing humanity that everyone should have. When will this change? Priya was enacted because of things that we're telling you today. I was a part of Priya being enacted in Bedford Hills. I left Rikers Island to go into a state prison where the sexual abuse continued. We talk about pipelines. Let's be clear on what the system overall represents, the types of pipelines that the system represents, that boxes us into, that forces us to have to live through, and then you call us monsters. The nerve, the audacity to call us monsters when everyone, everyone has a role in these situations, silence is an act of guilt. Allow your silence to shake you for a minute. 
Look at yourselves in the mirror. Those of you that <laughs> work on Rikers and represent law enforcement, why did you take an oath? Why? Be real and honest with yourselves. Because if you continue to look at those of us like we are less than, how do we look at you? How can I respect you? How can I value you? How can I see your humanity? How? When you don't see mine. The time is now. We cannot continue to have these conversations over and over and over and over again. We cannot. Over 700, 700 women filed lawsuits, allegedly, right, claiming alleged sexual abuse. Something's wrong with that number. And if you think seven, over 700 women are lying, I know I'm not lying. I even wrote about it in a book, my book, to tell my truth, because I'm tired of being labeled, and I'm tired of you saying I'm less than and not worthy, and I'm tired because I continue to see the same things happening over and over and over again. Again, why are we here today? So if nothing we've said here today has changed anything in you, your thoughts, the ways you see us, to believe us. What's the point? And who are we? Who are you as human beings? Who are you? What's, what are you here for? What are you here for? I want to thank you all for coming. I appreciate you getting here as hard as that may have been this morning. Um, we're not going to take questions for this panel as requested, but I just want you to know that you are heard. Um, this council cares about you and it cares about what we do here and the work and the powers that we have to try to make things better which is why we're having this hearing, which is why we've continued to ask about this issue repeatedly throughout our hearings. And um, it's unacceptable, everything you've gone through. It's completely unacceptable, it's disgusting, and it's shameful. Um, but I really just wanna extend my gratitude for you being here. We also have um, a group of young people here today who've asked to come to this hearing specifically. And so what you're saying in, in your testimony and your words is having, is, is like having a very real effect right now on people who are trying to understand the world and the world they're about to enter. And I, I really appreciate you being here to share that with them. So thank you. Um, so we have a couple of new members here. Uh, uh, thank you, Councilmember Stevens, Rivera, Ressler, Abreu. I know Ayala's online. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Rivera to just say some remarks about your bill, and then we'll switch over to the admin. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. We, we believe you. Um, Thank you for sharing. This is, it's physically sickening to hear this, to know that you were on the city's care and went through this over decades. Uh, this council, you know, we've banned solitary confinement. We passed the Gender Motivated Violence Act. It's not enough. Um, it's not enough. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna fix this. It has not, it will not address your pain, but we're gonna keep going. And I want to thank Chair Nurse for her leadership. She convened this deeply important hearing. And of course, for uh, really just hearing my bill, Intro 792, I passed a bill that was very similar to this in 2018 to hold the NYPD Special Victims Division accountable. 
creating case management systems to actually track and monitor investigations, cases, and other activities of that division because we found out they actually weren't doing it. They didn't have the capacity, they didn't have the personnel, and this bill would require the Department of Correction to use a case management system to track investigations of sexual abuse. And it won't fix everything, but we need to know and we need the accountability. Um, with more than half of the Adult Survivor Act filings related to Rikers Island, it's clear that there is an epidemic of sexual abuse in the jail system and the Department of Correction has a duty to care for those in its custody and they must be held accountable. Right now, we're seeing that a lot of the reporting finds that investigation into these accusations are actually happening under this administration, so from 40 years up to right now, and I'm sure beyond that. More than 40% of the department's investigations into sexual abuse and sexual harassment allegations last year dragged on beyond a local and federal mandate that cases be fully investigated and closed within 90 days after a complaint is filed. So justice delayed, as you can imagine. It is clear that council must implement further protections to ensure that individuals who are in DOC custody are not being sexually abused and that perpetrators are being held accountable. So again, I wanna thank Chair Nurse, I wanna thank my colleagues, and I just wanna thank you all really from the bottom of my heart for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. So we're now gonna switch over to the admin. Um, if you would like to stay for the hearing, um, we can make some chairs available for you all. Uh, if the sergeants can make sure there's enough space for you all to sit. Um, and we're gonna uh, transition now. Okay, I'll now introduce our panel of administration witnesses and turn it over to the committee council to swear them in. From the Department of Correction, we have Commissioner Linnell McGinley Liddy, uh, General Counsel James Conroy, Associate Commissioner of Facility Operations Ned McCormick, Deputy Director of Special Unit, Investigation Unit Ingress Martinez, Assistant Commissioner of Training and Development Jeremiah Johnson, Assistant Commissioner of Programs and Community Partnerships Valerie Graysock, and from Correctional Health Services we have uh, Senior Assistant VP Communications and External Affairs for uh, New York City Health and Hospital, CHS, Jeanette Mer uh, Merrill. Our second panel will hear from Commissioner Jocelyn Straver from the Department of Investigation. If all the witnesses present uh, could raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? 
noting for the record that all witnesses have answered affirmatively. You may begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Nurse and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I'm Linnell McGinley Liddy, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction. My colleagues and I are here to discuss a very sensitive and important topic, the prevention of and response to sexual assault and harassment within our jails. I want to be clear at the outset, sexual assault and harassment are not tolerated within our jails. People working in and visiting the jails, as well as those in our care, must remain safe and free from harm. The Prison Rape Elimination Act is a federal statute that outlines the essential elements required to prevent the sexual abuse of individuals in correctional facilities. Finalized in 2012, the act provides standards in the areas of prevention, training and education, screening for risk of sexual victimization and abusiveness, ways for people in custody to report sexual abuse and harassment, agency response following a report, investigations, discipline, medical and mental health care, data collection and review, and audits and appropriate corrective action. The department began working towards compliance with these standards in 2015. Board of Correction minimum standards for the elimination of sexual abuse and sexual harassment outline many of the same standards as PREA and went into effect in January 2017. Our goal is not only to comply with PREA standards, but to adopt more comprehensive best practices that ensures everyone who enters our jails, whether staff, people in custody, or visitors remain safe. Policies and procedures related to the prevention of and response to sexual abuse and harassment of people in custody are managed by the department's PREA Compliance Unit and PREA Investigation Unit. PREA Compliance staff work to create a culture and environment within the jails that promotes the detection and reporting of sexual misconduct, prevents retaliation against anyone who reports sexual abuse, and provides ongoing support and res resources to individuals who are the victims of sexual abuse. The PREA investigation staff respond to allegations of sexual abuse and harassment and ensure that victims are separated from alleged perpetrators and receive prompt medical care and mental health support and conduct any resulting investigations. As of October 2024, the pre-investigation unit is comprised of 19 investigators, with each investigator handling an average 25 cases at any given time. All DOC staff, as well as contractors and volunteers who work in our jails, are required to take an in-person training designed to identify and eliminate sexual abuse and harassment. The training instructs that all reports must be taken seriously and forwarded immediately to the de department's PREA investigation unit. A refresher training is required every two years. Upon entering custody, every individual is screened for their risk of sexual victimization and abusiveness. This screening is used to determine the most appropriate housing options for each individual. PREA compliance staff conduct an in-person orientation with all new admissions. This allows individuals to ask questions during the orientation or privately at its conclusion. During the orientation, staff inform new admissions of the many ways to report an allegation. <laughs> Reporting an incident of sexual assault can be incredibly difficult and therefore the department provides many different pathways for individuals to make a report, including calls to various hotlines, to the Board of Correction, and the Department of Correction, and the Department of Investigation, sorry. Reports may be also submitted by a third party and will be forwarded to the pre-investigation unit. Importantly, DOC staff are mandated reporters if they suspect or witness sexual misconduct, they must report the incident to the PREA unit. 
Reports can be submitted anonymously, and there is no time limit on when an individual can report an allegation of sexual abuse or harassment. A cornerstone of eliminating sexual abuse within the jails is a fair and thorough investigative process. As a first step, any time an individual alleges that they were sexually abused by staff, DOC sends that information to DOI for clearance to conduct an internal investigation. DOI will either allow DOC to investigate or ask DOC to stand down, and they will investigate itself. If the matter is cleared for investigation, PREA investigations will move forward. They will respond to the facility of the alleged incident, often within 24 hours, to speak with the victim and any potential witnesses. They will review Genetech video and phone calls and the backgrounds of those involved in the allegation and collect any other evidence. Critically, PREA investigators also ensure that the victim is immediately separated from the alleged perpetrator and receives supportive services, including medical services and a referral to mental health services. Following a report, PREA compliance staff will tour the facility regularly and check on victims and monitor for any signs of retaliation. The department completes a preliminary review of all sexual abuse and harassment allegations within 72 hours of the allegation being reported. Following this, allegations are assigned as PREA reportable or not PREA reportable as defined in the PREA standards. Allegations that are PREA reportable include any allegation that involves sexual abuse by staff, repeated reports of sexual harassment by staff, and non-consensual sex acts, abusive sexual contact, and sexual harassment between individuals in custody. Non-PREA allegations include, for example, a one-time allegation of sexual harassment and consensual sex acts between individuals in custody. I would emphasize that although an allegation might not be PREA reportable, it is still taken seriously and investigated thoroughly. PREA standards require that all cases must be closed within 90 days of the allegation being made. If an investigation reveals criminality, the case will be referred back to DOI. Those cases will remain as pending until they are closed out by those parties. While some recent cases have exceeded the 90-day closing requirement, the majority of cases are closed within 90 days. Once an investigation is completed, it is classified as substantiated, unsubstantiated, or unfounded. Allegations are substantiated if determined to have occurred based on a preponderance of evidence. Unsubstantiated allegations are ones in which the evidence is insufficient. Unfounded allegations are those proven false. Staff who are found to have violated departmental policies that contributed to a sexual assault are disciplined and may be terminated. Staff found guilty of a crime are terminated. Individuals in custody are also subject to discipline and possibly rearrest if an allegation against them is substantiated. The safety and well-being of DOC staff and anyone else who works in our jail is of paramount importance. They deserve a workplace free from violence and harassment. Everyone who works in the jails is required to complete a situational awareness training prior to entering the facilities. DOC supervisory staff are expected to tour jails regularly to assess and abate conditions that may lead to violence or harassment. In addition, staff and leadership positions throughout the agency continue to tour the jails on a regular basis to observe conditions, speak with staff and individuals in custody, and address any issues they observe while they are on tour. Unfortunately, despite these efforts, staff, external providers, and volunteers have experienced sexual assault and harassment from individuals in custody. 
such instances are not within the purview of PREA guidelines, and a separate investigation process is managed by the Department's Correction Intelligence Bureau. Following a report, CIB interviews the victim as soon as possible and collects witness statements and other potential evidence to make a charge and arrest. If an arrest is made, all pertinent documents are forwarded to the Bronx District Attorney. Assaults on staff are traumatic experiences, and our approach centers on immediate intervention, ongoing support, and fostering resilience. Supervisors meet staff to check on their well-being and offer support immediately following an assault and throughout their recovery. By addressing the emotional, physical, and psychological needs of staff, we aim to provide a safe, supportive work environment for all employees. In addition, the Department Corrections Assistance Response for Employees Unit provides a holistic range of support and resources, including counseling, spiritual guidance, and referrals to professional providers. The care unit, as it is called, is comprised of veteran officers who can share in the staff's experience and offer compassionate, peer-based support. They tour the facilities regularly to check in on staff and encourage them to access the support, supportive resources available to them. If a victim would like to seek services external to the agency, we also refer them to the Employee Assistance Program for support. Let me now turn to the proposed legislation, Intro 792, which would require DOC to establish and maintain an electronic case management system to record all data related to reports of sexual abuse and harassment of individuals in custody. During the last year, the department has been procuring and implementing a new electronic case management system. The system is designed to document and track cases investigations, and disciplinary actions department-wide. The PREA unit, investigation unit, was selected as the first unit to go live with this application. Once fully operational, this system will greatly improve the department's ability to document and track sexual abuse and harassment complaints, adhere to the deadlines associated with the cases, and report in compliance with oversight requirements. The department supports this les legislation, but would request adjustments to the effective date to allow for a reasonable time to ensure the application meets the requirements outlined in the bill following this pilot phase. Intro 830 would require the department to develop a comprehensive training program for investigations of sexual assault and harassment and to report on training. In addition to the foundational PREA training that all staff are required to complete, PREA and CIB investigators received additional in-service training on investigation procedures, as well as cross-training with the NYPD and other subject matter ex experts. Although we would propose minor amendments to ensure that training requirements are in line with best practices, we support formalizing the requirement for staff who undertake this sensitive work. We look forward to working with the council to address our concerns. Finally, let me restate that the department has a zero tolerance policy for anyone engaging in sexual misconduct in our facilities. We take this issue extremely seriously. We are committed to making improvements to ensure that we are not only in compliance with prayer standards, but more importantly, that all people who live, work in, or visit our facilities are safe. I am personally committed to continuing this work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Good morning, Chair Nurse and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I am Jeanette Merrill, Senior Assistant Vice President of Communications and External Affairs for New York City Health and Hospitals Correctional Health Services, also known as CHS. I appreciate the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on preventing and addressing sexual assault and harassment in city jails. 
My testimony will focus on CHS's efforts to help address sexual assault, abuse, and harassment against both our staff and our patients, as well as the care we provide to patients who have experienced sexual abuse. The safety of our staff, particularly those who provide patient care in the jails, remains a top priority for CHS. In recent years, CHS has expanded the size and scope of the team that manages its safety operations and has worked to build stronger partnerships and workflows with the New York City Department of Correction. Together, CHS and DOC have developed and implemented situational awareness training, which includes addressing workplace sexual abuse and harassment as a part of the CHS new employee orientation. The CHS safety team also regularly conducts rounds in the jail facilities and risk assessment walkthroughs with our healthcare unions, 1199, 1180, DC37, Doctors' Council, and the New York State Nurses Association. Last calendar year, CHS staff reported 311 workplace violence incidents, which included 56 sexual offenses. Following a workplace violence incident against our staff, CHS works with DOC to implement plans to support staff and mitigate future risk. These may include employee or patient transfers or separation orders. In addition to documenting the incident, the CHS safety team meets with the employee to check on their well-being, to offer resources and support, and to assist the employee in completing an incident form and in receiving a medical evaluation if necessary. This is in addition to the real-time support provided by direct supervisors. If the employee would like to file criminal charges against a patient involved in a workplace violence incident, CHS will connect the individual with the DOC Correction Intelligence Bureau. We will continue to work with DOC and our unions to ensure we maximize our staff safety in the workplace, not only because it is their right as employees, but also because a safe environment is necessary for the provision of quality health care. Beginning in January 2016, CHS became the city's direct provider of carceral health care as a new division of New York City Health and Hospitals, ending a decades-long practice of contracts, most recently with Corizon, a private for-profit correctional health care company that the New York City Department of Investigation, DOI, determined had significant breakdowns and acute failures in its employee screening and hiring practices. CHS immediately implemented new, robust processes for conducting employee background checks and security screenings. CHS established as policy that it will not hire, continue the employment, or retain the services of any person who may have contact with patients who has engaged in sexual abuse in a prison, jail, or other institution, or who has been convicted of, or civilly or administratively adjudicated for committing sexual abuse in the community. All CHS staff are required to complete Prison Rape Elimination Act training, CREA training, to report any allegations, knowledge, or reasonable belief concerning any incident of sexual abuse or harassment towards a patient, regardless of whether the alleged perpetrator is another patient or a staff member. CHS staff report such cases to CHS operations, which documents the incident, generates a reporting form, and notifies key CHS and DOC staff, which includes the DOC Special Investigations Unit. Allegations involving CHS staff are also reported to DOI. CHS staff involved in an allegation will be immediately removed from contact with the patient who has experienced the alleged abuse. Based on the investigation findings of DOC and DOI, appropriate disciplinary action is taken and may result in work, reloca work location reassignment, removal from all direct patient care, or termination of an employment, and may include reporting to professional licensing authorities. We recognize the profound responsibility we have as healthcare providers to ensure the health and well being of our patients, many of whom enter our care with previous exposure to trauma and abuse, and all of whom have limited agency by virtue of being in a carceral setting. All patients are screened at intake for a history of trauma, including sexual abuse, and those who scream affirmatively are offered follow up care with a medical and or mental health practitioner. We work to provide individualized, trauma-informed care to all of our patients, 56% of whom are enrolled in our mental health services. All patients who are housed at the Rosam Singer Center are further screened for a history of intimate partner violence during the new admissions process, and CHS's gender-related services meets with all patients who screen, affirm screen affirmatively to offer additional services, such as IPV-focused counseling. Last calendar year, 5.2% of the 19,453 patients who responded to the questions reported a history of IPV. However, we understand that many patients choose not to disclose their history of sexual abuse or IPV during intake, and mental health clinicians and psychiatric providers consider and assess for trauma symptoms during all clinical encounters. 
Patients can be referred to mental health services or gender-related services at any point during their incarceration. CHS has also established multiple pathways for patients to report jail-based sexual assault, abuse, and harassment. In addition to initiating a report with any DOC staff, a patient can disclose abuse to any CHS staff person during any, clinical, any encounter, including another clinic appointment, or can call the CHS health triage line to speak directly with the nurse. Patients' family members and other external parties can also share their concerns by contacting CHS's patient relations department or by calling the 24-7 CHS operations phone line. Following an allegation, the patient is seen in the clinic for a medical evaluation. During the medical evaluation, the clinician will perform an examination to identify any physical indication of bodily trauma or injuries, will document these findings in the patient's medical record, and will follow up as is clinically appropriate. The clinician will also offer post-exposure prophylaxis when applicable. CHS refers all patients who report sexual abuse to the mental health service for follow-up care and to CHS's sexual assault advocacy team for additional support, which includes the sharing of jail-based and community-based resources. When a forensic examination or evidence collection is indicated, the patient is transferred to the hospital emergency department. All 11 New York City health and hospitals acute care facilities, including Elmhurst Hospital, where CHS's female patients primarily receive acute care, and Bellevue Hospital, where CHS's male patients receive acute care, are designated as safe centers of excellence by the New York State Department of Health, meaning they have specially trained sexual assault response teams in each emergency room. On their return from the hospital, patients are brought to the clinic to ensure hospital recommendations are incorporated into CHS treatment plans. Establishing a relationship of trust between provider and patient is paramount to our ability to provide the best possible care, and part of building that trust is ensuring zero tolerance of sexual assault, abuse, and harassment. This work involves every department and clinical service within CHS, and we remain committed to working with all of our stakeholders to prevent and address sexual abuse in the jails against both patients and staff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both for your testimony. Um, I'm gonna ask just, I'm gonna ask uh, about six or seven questions and then we have some members who wanna ask. I wanna recognize Council Member Sanchez who's on Zoom, Caban, Narcisse, thanks for joining us. Um, I think I just wanna start out. Commissioner, how long have you worked within DOC for the record? I've been with the department since 2015, September of 2015. Um, can I ask you, with all these allegations and what you heard today, do you believe that there's a problem at Rikers? Do you believe these, these stories? I believe that we really need to look into it. Um, I do believe that people have raised some serious concerns. And I think that as a department that we have to truly like lean in and make sure that these concerns are addressed. And Part of it is also like just even screening people before they come to work at the department, screening contractors, visitors. It, you know, sitting here and listening to it, it, it really, it is concerning. And as a department, we have to really address these issues. It can't be every time we, we say something on the record and then we don't really do the work. Yeah. But just to, to kind of get to a yes or no, do you believe the women, the stories that were told today? I, I believe what they're saying, yes. Thank you for that, because I think that's really important and foundational for us in how we're gonna have this conversation today, because I think we're all aware that what the council has powers to do and what we don't have powers to do. Um, and what we really can do is just bring you all here to, ask, to answer questions honestly, truthfully, and provide as much information that you have that we don't have. You know, we don't work in this facility. We don't, you know, we don't hire folks there. We don't do the disciplinary actions there. Everything that we have is based on reporting that we have to come up with in legislation or from you all or from people who go through it. Um, and so all we have is these kinds of moments to set the record straight and try to get as much correct as possible. So it's really foundational that you believe what you're hearing when women are coming and taking time out of their day to, to share something so painful. And for people to, to file 700 
lawsuits. Um, that's really important, so thank you for saying yes. Um, so on the topic of investigations and accountability, um, during our hearing in April on DOC's grievance process, Assistant Commissioner Levine told us that during a preliminary investigation into a staff member, if the investigations division believes it has a founded sexual abuse case, the department can suspend staff members. Assistant Chief Rembert added that depending on the nature of the allegations, a service member can also be placed on modified status or removed from the facility where they are currently working before a full investigation is concluded. And I'd like to know a little bit more about how these determinations are made. Can you give us more detail on what is considered a founded sexual abuse case such that the department would move ahead with a suspension or modified duty before a full investigation is complete? What sort of evidence of sexual abuse would need to exist for the department to make that determination? Concretely, and as in painstaking detail as you can. Yeah, go for it. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ingus Martinez. I am the Deputy Director of Investigations for the PREA unit. Um, I first and foremost, I want to say that hearing these stories today, I am very glad to be part of this team and thankful that these, these federal standards are being adhered to and in place. I'm sorry that this happened so long ago, but in practice, putting PREA into practice will help that, there are, that we diminish these types of stories. Okay. Um, our, investi our investigations begin with an allegation. At the time of an allegation, if staff is involved, we immediately send it out to DOI for clearance. There is no delay beyond the, from the initial of the complaint, immediate DOI clearance from minutes to up to 24 hours, and then taken um, by t sending out investigators onto the field to conduct interviews in a confidential setting. I want to let the council know that our investigators conduct our interviews in a compassionate method we take our time, we ensure that all the information is documented that one time, not to re-victimize our persons in custody, ensuring that separation orders are put into place and that mandated services are adhered to and continue with supportive services. Thank as you. far can as you, unfounded- can you, Founded, please, uh, can okay. we focus on um, what is considered a founded sexual abuse case? So How do you make that determination? So our determinations are based on the federal standards. The federal standards for unfounded is that we prove, based, the burden of proof is, be, um, sorry, based on the preponderance of the evidence. Unfounded means that we prove that it did not happen. Okay, so, can you, sorry, can you restate that last part again? Okay, thank you. Um, so. We're saying that the unfounded, based on the federal standards definition, using the preponderance of the evidence, using our business records, using our electronic monitoring services, we proved that it did not occur. Your question earlier was about um, staffing and how, um, as far as uh, discipline, no, my question was up. just on more detail on what is considered founded. My preamble was a little bit about that, but yes. just wanted to understand what is considered founded sexual abuse in a case. I, I thank you for answering that question. Um, so when it comes to uh, making that determination, can you suspend or modify a correction officer or somebody who works their status until you've decided if it's founded or not? So investigation can make the determination. Investigations does not do it for the department. So my, Being no, let, me let, me, let me just clarify that. So if there's an allegation and there's some initial um, 
evidence presented that the department can suspend right away at that point in time and can modify that staff member pending the investigation. And who makes those de uh, that decision it can in, that, be, in that meantime it period? Can, it can be because the um, PREA unit, they do the initial, based on the initial, they can move forward with suspension modification while the investigation is pending. Okay, and so what kind of evidence specifically, uh, thank you for answering that, what kind of evidence specifically are you looking for to make it a founded, to determine if it's a founded uh, sexual abuse? So for founded investigations, we use the preponderance of the evidence is mostly based on business records, monitoring electronic devices, and we also are now able to file our own NYPD complaints on behalf of the victims. We do the collections, uh, we are part of the chain of custody for the collection of the sexual assault kits. Um, and based on the determination that the OCME gives us, will help us sway whether or not the incident is founded. Okay, thank you, thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, as of, July 1st, 2024, uh, the department reported that they had about 14 staff members currently under investigation based on sexual abuse allegations. Is this still the current number I'm not of open investigations? I'm sorry, you said 14? Yes. Okay. I'm familiar with the number 14, but not of open investigation. Well, how many open investigations around sexual abuse allegations exist right now within the department? Just the department wide. So year to date for 2024, we have 193 reported incidents. Okay. We currently have 88 pending. 88 pending? Yes. So they're open? Open, yes. Okay. Under, with the understanding that based on the date that it's open, it's a 90-day calendar. Understood. And so what, in, in those 88, um, are the, uh, how many, you said, um, how many are over the 90 days? At this moment, we have four over the 90 days, and that's due to circumstances, um, including sexual assault kids, pending DA review, DOI takeovers. How many DOC staff members accused of sexual abuse are currently suspended or have been placed on modified duty as a result of sexual abuse allegations? I don't have that information. I'd be glad to get it back to you. We'll get that to you, Chair. Okay. This is a hearing on sexual abuse, preventing sexual abuse at DOC, what you're doing to prevent it, knowing how many staff members are currently suspended or on modified duty is like a pretty basic question here. Hopefully we can get that information before Just this hearing is over. Just wanna clarify something, council member? Yes. So if you're, you're mentioning staff, so if there is something involving staff, we absolutely include the Department of Investigation. Your question today about um, this particular uh, year to date, I don't have any for this year. Okay. I can get you disciplinary for the duration of, of previous investigations that either closed or remain open. Okay. You know, I really hope we don't have a hearing this kind of way. Like, this, we should have some basic information here. During 2024, how many correction officers have been fired or resigned after investigation into sexual abuse? So, council member, I don't have that, but I'll get it to you before this hearing closes. Okay. I just want to like note that you know we have young people here who are looking at how our government is run. It, I mean, this is some basic foundational shit right now. Um, pursuant to standards set by the Board of Correction. Investigations of sexual abuse must be completed within 90 days of receiving a complaint. In 2020 and 2021, all investigations were completed within that time frame. However, a recent analysis by Gothamist found that the share of investigations taking over 90 days to complete increased significantly. 
from 23% in 2022 to 45% in 2023. Can you tell us a little bit about what the delays are in achieving the 90 day mark? Thank you. So first I wanna reiterate that we take every single allegation. Understood. I understand that. But you don't have certain data here, but I understand that. Yes. So I don't need to hear that again, please. So for the PREA reportable cases that are out in the public reports, the 45% increase in our delay were due to staff, um, staff leaving our department. After COVID, we also lost um, management. The, the number of cases, the definition of what was pre-reportable and not pre-reportable, basically was over-reporting. So the over-reporting of the cases led to the department reviewing the, depart the policy. So anything incidental to the scope of the officer's duty was now not pre-reportable. So that's one of the reasons for the decline in the reporting in the uh, of pre-reportables currently. Okay, so We've also changed our processes. Okay. We've ensured that our investigators conduct fuller preliminary investigations due to the high turnover rate of our staff. It was kind of like we're passing down minimal information back and forth to the next investigator while they're still catching new cases. While, because we now do fuller investigations on the preliminary level. We make better determinations on what is reportable to the department, ensure that every single question is asked rather than uh, resending investigators out, overusing what minimal resources and staff we have. Now with the preliminary investigations being fu fuller, being able to make a better determination, our numbers reported out for incidents are lower. So staffing, staffing issues. And hey, you, sorry, how many, Chair, yeah, can I just, uh, just add to that? One of the, one of the issues uh, at DOC is we would have, if a staff member is out for an extended period of time, we have to make, we have to make some concessions and, and, and put things in place to ensure that those cases are being looked at. So one of the things that we did during this process is identifying if someone's out, their cases don't just languish, they don't just stay there. So we've um, implemented a process where we have cross training and we have redundancy where people are, you know, I will cover for you if you're out on extended leave. So that's, especially considering all of our staffing challenges, we made sure that people were cross trained and able to do both tasks at the same time. Okay, and you have about, I think you said 19 investigators? 19 investigators, okay. and we're looking to onboard additional ones. Job postings are up, we're interviewing, trying to onboard new people. What's the ideal number of investigators that would kind of help bring down this, this caseload or help you move through the caseload faster? I think we are looking for 14 additional uh, investigators, so I think that's about the sweet spot that would, would assist us. That, um, that aligns with the Board of Correction um, recommendation? Yes. And um, just question, what does uh, fuller investigation mean? So, I'm sorry, fuller preliminary investigations. So basically, uh, considering taking all the information, the one time, again, not to re-victimize our persons in custody, collecting all the business records at one time, where previously we had the high volume of complaints, but collecting minimal information and kind of like leaving it for the full investigation uh, person to collect it. No, we're not doing that anymore. We're holding our supervisors, our peer supervisors responsible that every information, piece of information, every business record is collected. We're doing reviews of our video and telephone monitoring systems in the beginning rather than waiting, let us sit, case it, let us sit, and then before the 90 day hurry up and no, we're not doing that. We're doing that from the beginning in order to manage and be able to make better determinations for our reporting. Understood. Um, okay, so in I think the opening testimony you said there's, so there's 19 investigators, they have a caseload of about 25. Yes. Is that correct? I can, I can give you a further breakdown. 
So the 19 investigators right now, everybody has dual roles. I mentioned the preliminary investigators. My the question 19, is about what's the caseload per investigator? So the, the investigators that, uh, that go out, all, all 19 investigators go out into the field. Of those 19, 14 are available for full investigations. So we determined that um, it falls under the federal standards, under the BOC minimum standards, um, and requires additional uh, investigation or uh, it falls under the New York State Penal Law 130s under sex crimes, and now we're, we have to go file a police report, we have to wait or await results for the sexual assault kit. So those type of cases are assigned just to those 14. Okay. The rem the and remaining how many cases do those 14 folks normally have? So, so remember, it's a, it's a rotating basis of 90 days. Is The pre-reportable for those type of full investigators is about 10 cases and then total is 25 because every single non pre reportable case those one time harassments type they still necessitate a full investigation so all the background all the business records review of all the video review of all the telephone statements canvases mandated services so we make sure that we document everything completely exactly the same for both type of investigations so generally, an investigator will carry about 25 cases on a rotating basis, and remembering that the, only the 10 is for 90 days, and the remainder is for statute, for administrative service uh, charges for about 18 months. Okay. How many positions in the investigative division are filled by temporary duty officers? So for my unit, for the investigation division unit, we have um, officers, 10 TDY, and then supervisors, we have three TDY. But TDY in the sense that I have four, in, four investigators that have been with us for over six years, and then the remaining six over a little less than two years, and six permanent that have been there seven to eight years. So that makes up my investigative staff. My supervisory staff, I have six supervisors, two that are permanent and three that are TDY uh, with less than two years with us and, and only two permanent. Can you, um, can you tell me what uh, TD, TDY is, just for the record? Very duty assignment. Okay. Sorry. And that uh, for us, um, it covers, you know, like if, if they need to be transferred, any type of um, the seniority list, their, their seniority number is based on their facility, assigned facility rather than in-house. Okay, understood. Just wanted to know what the acronym was. Are there, um, are there any circumstances where a DOC captain will conduct a pre-investigation? So it, within the investigation division, we have captains that are in the role of supervisors. I'm not sure of the question, are you mentioning facility base or PREA? If, if there are any circumstances in which a DOC captain would conduct a PREA investigation. So all investigations of PREA, uh, of PREA incidents are confidential. We do not use facility staff to conduct any type of uh, statements, collection, review. The only time they're in any type of process is uh, retrieving uh, the documents for and ensuring that they get, get, excuse me, get escorted to the clinic or as a mandated reporter as part of the coordinated response. If they were the first responder, they have to submit reports to us. That's it. Okay. Um, Chair Nurse, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, just before circling back on something early, uh, General Counsel James Conroy, we did have, um, in mm -hmm. fact, some of the, the stats regarding um, the discipline outcomes. Great. So we currently have um, in this year, in 2024, uh, five cases that were either still open or pending. Uh, some of that is carryover from allegations from 2023. Uh, one is related to a staff on PIC abuse uh, with an inappropriate touching, non pre reportable. Uh, that captain was suspended for 30 days, and I think the, the final charges are pending. Um, with respect to staff uh, inefficient duties during PIC on PIC incidents, 
we have three that are still open and one that was a deferred prosecution with a resignation. So. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, my last question before I turn it over. Um, when DOC conducts investigations into allegations of sexual abuse, the substantiation rate of those investigations falls below national averages. Since 2015, just one half of 1% 1 of the PREA reportable sexual abuse allegations made against correction staff were deemed substantiated, representing seven of nearly 1,500 allegations. For allegations of sexual abuse made against other people in custody, the substantiation rate was 3.4% in 2023. Both of those rates fall far below the national average, which is about 6%. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you attribute your low substantiation rates to? Thank you for the question, Councilor. Um, so for, I mentioned earlier about uh, the methods and what substantiation means. Substantiation uh, were Preponderance of the evidence is mostly based on video monitoring devices or those cases that go to the DA's office based on DNA kits, so on and so forth. What I want to share is that for calendar year 2024, we, we have seven substantiated pick on pick, sorry, excuse me, person in custody on person in custody um, sexual abuse cases and the one substantiated case for um, staff on person in custody that was non-sexual. The substantiated rates as published in the DOJ, we appear to align currently with the 5%. Okay, thank you. And I, I just wanna add also, if there's an allegation involving a staff member, that allegation is uh, initially forwarded to DOI and they are making a determination as to whether or not to proceed with the investigation or for us to stand down. And individuals in custody have other ways to report um, sexual abuse, sexual assault. They can go directly to, to, to some of these organizations and external um, oversights that we are not necessarily privy to. So I just, you know, just want to include that information as well. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, it's, it's good to know that we're, we're getting closer to the national average, but is there, what, what else besides what you've mentioned today, the additional methods that are, um, you're implementing, the staffing beyond that is, is is there anything else in the way of you being on par with the rest of, of the nation in terms of the substantiation rate? Well, I think one of the key things for us is uh, additional training. Um, we're definitely revamped our training and uh, uh, Dr. Johnson can speak to that. But I think it's important even from the onset, we're doing the, the required screening, we're doing the required vetting, um, and we're also looking at everyone who enters our facilities, uh, staff, um, also contractors, visitors, anyone entering our facilities. The, the key here I think is really about training and also implementing a system where we can track these complaints, track the outcomes, and that's what we've done with our case builder that's, that's fairly new that we're rolling out and we're looking to sort of make the necessary tweaks, but it's really having adequate data and understanding what's going on and I could tell you, you know, with the department, there are multiple, multiple databases for information and Case Builder is going to allow us to be more efficient and that we can share and track information department-wide as an agency and there's transparency. Okay, thank you for that. I wanna recognize um, <clears throat> Council Member Hanif on Zoom and I'm gonna open it up to members. We've got Marte Stevens, Kavan Rivera and Narcisse. So I'm gonna turn it over to Councilmember Marte. Uh, thank you, Chair Nurse. And I, before I begin my questioning, I really wanna thank the four women who are here. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for your power. Um, it speaks volumes and it definitely had an effect on all of us here today and everyone that's listening, so thank you. Um, I also wanna thank the students for being here. Um, you're seeing how government works and sometimes how it doesn't work. And that's really powerful for you to see because 
you guys are going to change the world next. And it's great that you have the opportunity to see how the system works internally. So thank you for being present. And thank you for, you know, being open to growth and, and giving up your day to be here. And for the panelists, um, in response to the recommendations made by the Board of Corrections, the department sent PREA investigators to the NYPD Special Victim Course, where they received specialized training on investigating sexually based allegation. Have all current PREA investigators received this training? Go ahead. Thank you for that question, Council Member. So that was back in uh, 2018. We did have all, all of our investigators attend NYPD criminal investigation course and sick, um, sorry, the special victims course. However, due to high turnover rates, those investigators that may have received that, that training are no longer here. We are working with our partners in NYPD to um, secure spacing and um, seats in the upcoming training. When was the last time you made that request uh, to NYPD to have your current uh, pre-investigators to receive this training? As of this week and last week. Okay. Can you give us a little background on what this training entails and how long is it? So off the top of my head, I've, I've attended these trainings many years ago. I've been with the department 18 years, so please excuse me. So um, if you have, you have details on the time, I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't want to speak. They might have changed the timing, how the length of the trainings. I can have someone look into it for you. Do you think it's best practice for these investigators, whether they re received it previously in 2018 or not, have refresher trainings on an annual basis at least to make sure that we have the best practice moving forward? Yes, I agree on training, refresher training, and I believe the unit just did a refresher training in May. Correct, internal. Yes, so I agree that training is a serious and important component here, and in fact, I've also reached out to external partners. We've secured a spot with the Bureau of Justice um, Assistance. There's a 14-week PREA training academy that they're rolling out, it's inaugural, and we have a seat at that table. I agree with you, and, and that's something that we're con constantly seeking out training opportunities, because that is, that is key. Okay. And, and, and Dr. Johnson, I, I don't know if you wanna just come up and, and address that training question, um, so that we, so that Council Member Marta is aware of what, what we're doing in terms of training. Good morning, my name is Jeremiah Johnson. I serve as the Acting Deputy Commissioner of Training and Development at DOC. I'm over the Correction Academy and within our portfolio is the PREA training uh, for all volunteers, contractors, and uh, staff, whether full-time or part-time, both the initial and the refresher training. So in, uh, we implemented the PREA training in 2016 it was revised uh, as recently as 2023. And this initial training is a, is a half day. It familiarizes learners with uh, the PREA legislation and the department uh, directive. It dispels common myths about sexual assault and harassment, defines key terminology, and establishes respectful language. Uh, it teaches how to identify vulnerable individuals in our jails, provides strategies for preventing sexual abuse and harassment, emphasizes zero tolerance and the duty to report, and also lays out reporting procedures and protections for retaliation. Um, I believe it's also noteworthy uh, to mention that all of our staff, uh, in response to the 2018 local law, 92 participate in the uh, DCAS sexual harassment prevention training for the last compliance training period uh, the Department of Correction achieved a 96% uh, compliance rate for that training and uh, Commissioner McGinley Liddy and I are, are 
committed to achieving 100% for the next compliance period, which concludes in August of 2025. Thank you. Uh, the department also previously sent PREA investigators to a forensic experimental trauma interview training designed to teach interviewers how to maximize opportunities for information collection during an interview. Have all current PREA investigators received this training? No, not everyone has received that training. Uh, are there plans for everyone to receive that training? We are exploring um, different um, agencies or pro to procure some type of training. Okay, uh, just a few more questions, Chair. Yeah. In April 2019, the Board of Corrections published an audit of DOC's handling of sexual assaults and sexual harassment reports, expressing concerns that interviews are not always carried out with alleged victims and alleged perpetrators, and that when interviews are conducted, they are not always in private and confidential location. How has the department changed its investigation practices since 2019? Thank you for that question. So since 2019, I mentioned earlier, we have changed our processes as, as far as maintaining the integrity of the investigation by interviewing the persons, the victims, one time. Where previously, 2017, 2018, the high call volume of complaints it was, we dispatch our investigators, they come back, we, he didn't want to talk, she didn't want to talk, and then it gets reported out and now it's a full case. Now you have a, another pair of investigators going out to then re-interview. Again, our aim is not to re-victimize our persons in custody. We collect all our business records from the beginning, where before it was, oh, we'll pick it up when it's a full investigation or, or whoever it's assigned. So we no longer use that practice. We, we hold our PREA supervisors responsible for when these dispatches are being done on a complaint level to ensure that all business records are collected, are documented, so that we don't have that delay that first we're reporting incidents that did not necessitate to be reported because it was in the scope of the officer's duties, for example, but we didn't get that full interview. Where are these interviews located? So currently, based on the layout of the different facilities, our investigators, when they respond to the facilities, considering um, situational awareness, they look into the housing area, perhaps the housing area may have an interview room. If it doesn't have an interview room, we have to take into consideration um, the feel of the housing area, you know, um, prior, prior incidents of persons in that housing area, we may speak to the officer and say, you know, um, uh, how many do you have today? Perhaps we could use a day room, but now we're disrupting minimum standards for those persons in, in the day room. We take into consideration all our situational awareness. There are times that our victims are already at the clinic, so we'll take advantage of interviewing them in the clinic and not in the housing area. The goal is when conducting these interviews is to find the space appropriate to have that conversation with the individual in custody. And how do you protect these witnesses or com complainers from retaliation? Because I think where you conduct those interviews and how you conduct those interviews and who's present in those interviews can make someone feel safe and protected from retaliation? What other measures are in place to make sure that people don't speak up and have to live with that fear? So one of the things that's done for sure at the beginning when we receive the allegation that individual is removed from the perpetrator, the victim, and so they're separated, um, they're provided with services, but we also monitor those cases for 90 days, right? to ensure that there's no retaliation. Our PREA compliance unit tracks those cases to ensure that the individual is not further victimized or retaliated against because of that allegation. So that work is ongoing, and if the victim uh, reaches out to us, then we follow up and, and do a further investigation if there's an incident of um, retaliation. And post those 90 days, 
what other measures that they have in place to be able to communicate uh, in with a, with within a protective uh, criteria? Well, it's the same measures that are in place. They are, you know, the information is stenciled throughout our facilities. They can utilize, uh, they can contact BOC, they can talk to an officer or a civilian staff member that's in their housing area if they need additional assistance. They can contact 311. You know, those measures are still in place and it's, it's not removed from them as they go through the process of being incarcerated in our care. And uh, you previous me previously mentioned that sometimes you work with witnesses to transfer them to other locations, uh, whether within the facility, whether it's in the clinic or some other type of housing accommodation. What determines that movement or that transfer and how do you make those decisions to make sure that person is safe? Okay, so first for every victim, we we generate separation orders from their aggressor, regardless if the aggressor is, a, is identified as another person in custody or staff member. As far as housing decisions, we also take into consideration from the beginning uh, of their incarceration, from them entering into intake, our, we use our screening tool for uh, housing decisions, and that's for their, also for their vulnerability. But for, during the investigation, on only based on the separation order is that we submit that to the facility and we personally do not make housing decisions but uh, at our level is sent out to custody management. Okay, thank you Chair. Thank you Councilmember Marte, Councilmember Stevens. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions but I just wanna make a statement because this has been a rough week for me because I also chair children and youth and I'm sure folks know that in the juvenile detention we have a lawsuit open, a class action lawsuit with over 100 people who've been sexually assaulted. I had a round table of foster care youth this week where they talked about how that system has been a place where they've been sex trafficked and now I'm sitting here and this is, it's, it seems like it's an epidemic. And so the reality is like, I'm like drained because this to me is like unacceptable and needs to be a priority for everyone. And even to hear like, you know, coming in and not having the answers, it feels like you know it's a problem, but it's like, is it really a problem? So I'm just having a hard time with a lot of it. Um, and especially with like women sitting across, like the urgency of like making sure this isn't happening is like urgent and it's not acceptable. And I'm just, it's, I'm struggling a little bit. It's, it's too much. And this is a place where people are supposed to be getting rehabilitated and we are re-traumatizing them. And so we are not doing our jobs. None of us, everybody in this room on our side and your side are failing because whatever we're implementing is not being, whatever we're putting in place here isn't being implemented. And so we're trying on this side and this side and like this division of like, oh, we're doing our best, we all need to take blame for it so we can move forward. And that's where it needs to start from. Because if young people are being sexually assaulted in the juvenile center and then they're ending up in Rackers, like what are we doing and saying what's happening in the streets? It's all a reflection. So it's not separate or different, we're just not doing our jobs well enough. And this has to be a priority. Like honestly, like we are re-traumatizing people. And I'm gonna start with some questions because even the people who are working there aren't feeling safe which is like, what is, like, it doesn't make sense. So correctional officers themselves are often victims of sexual assault and harassment while on the job. What protective measures does D DOC make, take to keep them, the workplace safe? Good morning, Chair, um, Council Member. My name is Ned McCormick and I am the Associate Commissioner of Facility Operations and I also oversee the Correctional Intelligence Bureau um, and could you just repeat the question, please? The basic question is, what are you guys doing to keep your staff safe from sexual assault? I appreciate the question. So at Department of Correction, to keep the staff safe, we offer them initial training, which is the situational awareness, and it gives them a sense of always being on guard and to know their surroundings well in the correctional uh, facilities. In addition to that, um, we have the 
care unit that speaks with the staff on a regular basis and ultimately it reminds them about um, what resources are available for them and ultimately to keep them safe. Um, we conduct training. There's a whole, um, uh, I guess, model of training that goes through DCAS that uh, these employees have mandatory training to include the sexual harassment training. Um, so you just do a lot of trainings like so what are some of the mental health treatments or things that you're doing like if that does happen to a staff member? Well if a staff member is assaulted they report that to their immediate supervisor who in turn will call the tour commander and that's basically reported to our central operational desk. Upon it being reported to our central operational desk uh, CIB is notified and an investigator is dispatched to take a preliminary statement from that employee. Um, once all the evidence is collected to include video evidence, witness statements, it is then turned over to the DA's office for review to determine if they're going to pursue uh, an actual arrest. And what services are provided to the person? Because I, I hear like there's a, obviously there's a procedure, right? Because we have to write that down. Yes, ma'am. But I'm your staff member. This happened to me. That's, that's like, well, because so I, I want to hear like also how you're like, this is traumatizing, right? Like what happens? What mental services are available? Do they get time off? Like, what does this look like? So I can tell you that there's more work for us to do here, right? With the care unit, um, the care unit, they're veteran officers, they're peers, um, and they are veteran correction officers throughout the facilities. So people are aware of who they are. They and do I have a tours. question. You started off that there's more work for us to do here. So then what are you doing then? Because like, you're at the head of it. And I so am, Tell me what you're doing. And I don't am, just tell me it's more work to I do. I am invest. I am actually looking into um, additional programs, different, diff, you know, additional trainings, especially for the care unit. Because mm -hmm. part of the thing is the care unit. There are veteran officers. They dispatch. They go out and talk to their colleagues. But they also need the adequate trainings as well. So right now we're looking at um, exploring additional training for them. Do They're, you have an idea of what those trainings would look like and where they are? Who? Who, like if you're saying that this Do is something you're looking into, do you have the trainings you've already been researching? Have you been looking into Dr. it? Dr. Mm -hmm. Johnson can talk a little more on that because right now they have, they're, they're trained on trauma-informed suicide prevention, but they need additional training. So, so where would that come from? Is it that you need additional funding? Like why hasn't it been implemented? Like what, what is the sense of urgency around it? It is a sense of urgency and we're looking at it right now. I'll, I'll turn over to- you start looking at it? months ago, even before I became commissioner, to be honest, because the reality is we have a lot of things that happen. Our staff are also facing traumatic events yeah. on a daily basis. And it, in, How you many know, people work in the CARES unit? We, it's approximately, I believe, 10 individuals in, a care, in the CARE unit. We're also looking to even staff it up some more. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson to talk about some of the things that we are looking at. So even before you at. turn it over, I have some more questions. What's the timeline on, because I said you said you were looking at this even before you came commissioner, so what's the timeline on getting these things that you say that they need the additional trainings implemented? It's as soon as possible. So then what does that mean? Because you've been here how long? 10 months as months. commissioner. So then as soon as possible, what does that look like in your timeline? Like I, I'm asking for like concrete like time. So you think like in the next three months, four months, another year, like what when you and like ideally, what would that look like for you? Actually, in the coming months, I hope by the beginning of the year, we'll have something solidified. Trust me when I tell you this is of extreme importance for me. I don't I'm not doubting that it's of, of extreme importance. I'm just trying to get to the place of like, what are the timelines so we can hold you accountable. So when you're being lucid as if saying like, oh, in a few months and this, when we come back to you, you can still be like, well, we're still I don't, working I on I don't it. need to be held accountable. I'm going to actually follow. No, actually you do because our job is to hold you accountable. No, but I'm telling you that this is of extreme importance for the department and for me personally, and we're going to do it. I'm happy to share the information once we've solidified it and provide it to you, but it is of extreme importance that the staff okay. feel safe and that there's holistic safety throughout our jails. Again, it is our job as council, and we can look it up in the charter, to have oversight and hold the agencies accountable. And so that is why I'm asking for more concrete lines and not just saying, 
uh, in a few months and being lucid. So, because, and you can't tell me that like, oh, it is of extreme importance. Because if it was extreme importance and I was in a hearing, I would have a timeline and I would have came with a timeline. Like, this is what I'm looking to implement in the next six months. This is what I'm looking to implement in the next year and not come and tell me that it is of extreme importance and I'm gonna do it. Because I would have came in ready for the work. And we could have had more of a strategy conversation about how do we work together. Well, That's we, why I'm asking you We can still have a strategy conversation. Well, because you're being lucid about it. No, and so I'm, I'm going to continue with my question. So I know you wanted to turn it over to him. Well, about because Dr. Things. Johnson has been working directly with the executive director of the care unit on this training. That's why, that's why I'm turning it over to him. Good morning, council member. So peer support is an evidence-based model that's shown to be effective across industries. I would say that for law enforcement, it is a unique context. And because of the stigma of pursuing support and mental health resources, it has been slower to develop. So there are national uh, training programs for peer support, but uh, I would say law enforcement is a little bit behind the curve when it comes to adopting these programs and actually having uh, dedicated staff to peer support. Uh, so as the commissioner said, there is the, the care unit with dedicated um, uh, officers, veteran officers uh, that respond to these incidents. But I've been working collaboratively with Director Osborne to identify a training program. Have you not identified it? Uh, I've, I've made recommendations to Director Osborne. You yes. have the recommendations and what you've recommended? Uh, so like I said, there there is a national organization of peer support. And is that uh, what you're uh, recommending for them to go through those trainings? I'm, I, I'm just, I'm sorry, and, I, and, and you guys keep saying that it's of high importance, but the information seems very lucid. I like, I, if some, my staff is a priority for me because the work that they do is a reflection of me. So I would literally come in here with a plan like, oh, these are the ones we looked at. This is what we're looking to get into. This is what, the, and I'm not even talking about the, the, um, the folks who are incarcerated. We're talking about your staff. And so for me, it's just like, I, I'm asking real questions like, do you have the, the ones that you're recommending? Do have you looked into it? And it's very lucid. Do you have a name of the program that you guys have looked into? Uh, you're saying it's the National Institute. What's the name of it? Is it, uh, have other people been there? Like, I'm just trying to get what the program is. Sure, I, I can provide that information to you at a later Are you gonna send it to us? Do you have it now? Like, I can send it to you. I'm gonna, so there, I'm, I'm gonna move there on is, from the question. Sure. If, if you guys can send over a breakdown of the programs that you're looking into to help the peer, um, your, the peer officers in CARES do this work, what the trainings are, what the expansion of this looks like, because you said you had 10 officers, what does the expansion look like in the next six months, what the turnover looks like, because like, this is your staff, you would think this would be a, a top priority, and I'm sure you're working on it, but it doesn't seem like you want to share with us. So I may have misunderstood your, your question, council member, in that we are working on resiliency training for all staff. This is an initiative that would involve both uh, members of care and academy staff that would, uh, through uh, Desert Waters, essentially deliver resilience training. Uh, but I, I understood your question to be about peer support training specifically for the members of, of care. So uh, we are looking to roll out train the trainer programming through Desert Waters as early as the first two weeks of December. And again, that's resiliency training that uh, both academy uh, instructors and care members would be qualified to uh, deliver to staff across Rikers Island. So your first round of trainings, new trainings that you're implementing is in December. So this is the uh, train the trainer model? Mm -hmm. I know that. Yes. Uh, in December. Either the yes, the first and half of December. how many people do you plan to have in that training? It would be 20 people. 
I, I would definitely have a lot more follow-up questions with that, but I have a couple more questions if you want me to just get through it. Um, in 2018, the department of, um, testified that in order to be successfully implemented, all the PRE standards and audits by DO, DOJ certified review would be conducted on facility by facility based until all the facilities are deemed PRE compliant. Are the audits complete and are all the facilities currently PREA compliant? No, they're not. So that, that, work, that work was started but was never completed. Um, so we are working, right now we have identified an auditor who is DOJ certified. Um, we identified that individual this past summer. Um, we're working on the procurement. My understanding, the procurement is near final. Um, and we're going to start with uh, the auditing, auditing two facilities, and then remain, the remaining facilities will be audited by, by the, uh, the auditor. I'm going to let you slide on that one, because once you said procurement, I know the process for that and how it's a hot mess. So I get why it didn't happen, because the procurement takes a really long time. I know, Council Member, I'm, I oversee the procurement unit, and I am assuring that this will be done by uh, early next week. We, this is where we are in the procurement process. So oh, we could begin the work very shortly, but immediately after that. What time again? I just said I know the process and I'm sorry. I, I, I'm I, sorry, I, I can't hard. hear you. you I speak. said I know how hard that procurement process is, so I, I get that piece. Cameras are essential for both the detection and investigation of sexual abuse. Sexual abuse tends to occur in small enclosed areas where people in custody are not expected to be, such as storage closets, laundry rooms, slot sink areas. During the 2018 council hearing, the legal aid testified that recommending recommended that body cameras should be required whenever staff is alone with the person outside of the view of fixed, um, fixed cameras. Will the department implement this recommendation? If not, why? So, um, so this past May, we had an incident with our body-worn camera where one actually exploded. As a result, I actually temporarily removed them offline. Um, we looked at all of the body-worn cameras and Ultimately, the decision is we're purchasing body-worn cameras for all staff, so they will be required to wear it on their person. We are in the process of procuring them, and I believe we should have them by December, all of the body-worn cameras. We currently have some in, in place right now. I believe it's over 900 throughout some of our facilities, but the goal is for everyone to wear a body-worn camera on their uniform when they come to work. So by December, you think that, that you'll be able to have that recommendation? Yes. Okay. DOI has recommended that the gel camera coverage be enhanced to correct, correct it for blind spots and extended to cover janitor closets and other closet room that officers are ass assessed with, such as persons, um, assist with, as, with persons in custody. They also recommend that DOH should retain um, footage from each camera for one year. Um, have all those recommendations been implemented? It does not sound that, that way because we don't have our retention policies 90 days. Um, so that was not, all of the recommendations have not been accepted. I'll take a look at those recommendations. Mm -hmm. That's from a 2018 report? Um, yes. Okay. In 2019, due to the BOC mandate of the department, began to a pilot program to put cameras into transfer, um, transport vehicles. What was the department's evaluation of this pilot project? Has the department now installed cameras on the vehicles used to transport people in custody? If not, why? So to answer that question, council member, yes, our transportation vehicles do have cameras, not all of them, but there are cameras uh, fixed to our, our transportation vehicles. What was the results of the pilot program? Did you deem it successful? Did you think that it was helpful? And is um, and if it was, or is the plan to implement the cameras in all of the cars moving forward? Is that something you guys are working on? We'd, we'd have to look into what, what were the results of the pilot, but ultimately we agree with having um, cameras on buses when people are being um, transported to and from a Rikers Island. Okay, I think those are all the questions I have. Um, and I just want to say again like for me this has been a really tough week for the lack of failure that on our part and I say our because we're all in this together and uh, of how we're not keeping people safe and that's a problem for me and the same way you say that you take it serious I take it extremely serious
So mm -hmm. we're all on the same page and we're not enemies. And so when we're asking questions, this is not about a got you. For me, it might be for other people, but for me, I'm asking the questions because I'm trying to be helpful and think about how to work together because I'm about the work and not just sitting here talking and looking for viral moments. I am looking to do the work to help the people who are most vulnerable. So I just wanna make sure that is on the record. Thank you. And I'm happy to work with you on this. Thank you, Councilmember Stevens. And I think your line of questioning is 100% appropriate. I mean, we were here in April when we had a grievance hearing. We asked specifically how you were reforming it. You said you were doing an audit. We've asked every single time since, when will the audit be complete? When will there be some initial recommendations on how you're changing things? Like every single time we've come back, we've asked. And we've never gotten an answer. We were told, oh, in a few months, which is what you just told Councilmember Stevens in a few months, and we've never gotten anything back in follow-up, in, in written format. And so it's, it's, not, just, it's not just that um, you know, the council member is pressing because of the nature of this topic, it's because we continue to not get definitive answers and a definitive timeline, which lets us know that we don't know what the hell is going on over there. Like we just don't know, like, is it in anybody's work plan? Is who's responsible specifically to carry it over the finish line? When will we ever get an initial understanding of what is going on? It's, it's very, very challenging and frustrating for us. And that's why you get this level of frustration coming at you. Um, so I do underscore that it is all on us, but we can only work together and collaborate when you communicate properly to us in an effective way. Um, Council Member Caban. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to a line of questioning that the chair did uh, earlier, specifically around um, substantiation. So you talked about uh, founded and unfounded uh, investigations. You said that the standard of evidence to substantiate a claim is the preponderance of evidence. Just for the record, for the public, for the people that are listening, what is the definition of preponderance of evidence? Okay, so the preponderance of the evidence is technically weighing out all the information in front of us and if um, the people behind me, if I'm trying to show them, if you use a scale and it just tips over to 51%. That's right, so in, in other words, a preponderance of the evidence equals that it's a demonstration that the proposition is more likely than not, just right. a, a cent over 50%. Now, you also talked about um, unfounded claims and the number of unfounded claims that you have, and you said if, if um, you defined unfounded as proving it did not occur, what is the level of proof you are using um, for unfounded claims? Based on the federal standards, it is the same, based on the preponderance of the evidence. However, we're using uh, monitoring devices. So for example, if a victim claims that said personnel on said date, then we go back and look at uh, the business records and prove that that person was not there. Okay, so I, I wanna uh, also, th that's perfect, because I wanna go into the evidence that you're looking at. You said the main sources of evidence that you're looking at are video monitoring and DNA testing, correct? Well, electronic monitoring includes telephone oh. statements as well. Okay, so you're relying a lot on, um, on these types. Now, are you aware that the legal standard across both civil and criminal investigations uh, and proceedings is that individual testimony alone, absent DNA testing, absent video evidence, uh, is enough to reach the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Correct, and ours is much lower just based on the preponderance of that. Well, I, but that's what I'm saying. So when I, when I hear you talking um, and answering the line of questioning around how much lower your substantiation claims are to the national averages, and I, and I say, well, the level of proof is a preponderance, it means it just has to be just barely more likely than not to occur, and then I also hear that the evidence that you are primarily re relying on is the video monitoring and electronic tracking. What I am then hearing is that that's not being done properly if an individual's testimony alone is not given the kind of weight it should be when again, in a criminal proceeding, that alone, absent any other kind of evidence, 
can prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. So to me, it sounds like the practice you're engaging in is, is, not, uh, is not adhering to the way that in our legal systems and legal proceedings, both criminal and civil, we look at and weigh and evaluate evidence. And so my, my, the thing that is troubling me is that it sounds like the individual testimony of survivors, because they are incarcerated people, that very strong, powerful evidence is not being weighed the same way it would be weighed for others. And that's a problem. And I think that could partially explain the disparities between the national averages and what we're seeing here. Um, in addition to that, I want to ask for just some other definitions because I want to know how this work is being done. How does DOC specifically define sex abuse currently? Still working. So under my, the federal, sorry. Sorry, my, okay. my iPad thinks I'm talking to it. Um, go ahead. Something went wrong. Let's try again. Don't call your mom. Yeah, something did go wrong. Yeah. Let me, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, so under the federal standards, sexual abuse or any sex crimes um, including the New York State Penal Law, sex crimes under the 130s, and inappropriate touching n that is not within the context of the officer or staff person's job scope. Okay, so does DOC additionally define any so-called red flags prior to sex abuse, such as grooming behavior or propensity towards such actions? Okay, so let me talk about what else entails in our investigation. So we also do um, unannounced rounds, which is under the detection portion of our investigations. And part of the detection is ensuring, holding our uh, frontline supervisory staff in the facilities responsible for doing tours, looking for those spaces where are, are not highly visible to the officer on, uh, on the floor, making tours into you know, under sensitivity, of course, into the, into the bathrooms, ensuring that each of the showers has one person, not two persons, ensuring that those grooming types of- I, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt for a second because you're not answering my question. I'm asking if you have any official definitions um, for red flags, such as grooming behavior or propensity towards such actions. Council member, we also have, um, there's a classification of discipline in an investigation called undue familiarity much of which falls within the types of behaviors that you're talking about. What, what falls within that? I'm sorry? What, can you list out like what that Grooming what behaviors, that? that would be something about inappropriate relationships and, and interactions between PICs and uh, staff, also between staff and staff. Okay, so what, is, what is that? What are inappropriate relationships or interactions? I mean, I think that speaks for itself. You know, no, it anything doesn't, that's outside, anything the that's outside, well, no, it's not the problem. It, it, it's actually anything that falls outside the scope of the employment and the duties and responsibilities no, no. of the okay. officers. Uh, with all due respect, and I'm gonna restrain myself here, we have such a proliferation of varying levels of sexual abuse where, and I'm gonna gender in this moment, but I know that everybody experiences th these things across the board, no matter what your gender is, where there are plenty of times as a woman that I have interacted with a man who thinks that their behavior was absolutely appropriate. So I think you do, as, as an administration, as an agency, have a responsibility to lay out exactly what kind of behavior is inappropriate, because I gotta tell you, it is not a well enough known thing, otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I'm gonna ask you again, because it doesn't speak for itself. The testimony of people here today proves that it doesn't speak for itself. Can you please list out what behaviors fall under inappropriate actions and relationships? Yeah, I, I don't have the specific actions memorized. It is laid out in the rules and regulations for the officer, so we could certainly um, follow up with you on a very specific behavior. Will you provide behavior. that, please? Can we I will. ask a few yes, more extra absolutely. questions, Chair? I'm sorry, what was, I didn't hear your last part. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, well, I want a copy of that, and oh. I just, I am still reeling from the idea that uh, it go, we all just know what inappropriate, yeah, uh, y'all, uh, I, I, I need a second. Um, okay, 
Well, let me ask you this then, to get into more specifics. Would did the Department of Corrections include, for example, uh, example, making verbal statements of a sexual nature as sexual abuse? No, the standards are very specific. When it comes to verbal harassment, we take the allegation, we investigate it, collect all business records, review all kinds of video, we do the uh, right. you're witness. But you're talking about verbal statements, Verbal right? statements, I and we treat it as a full investigation the okay. one time. For, under the federal standards, for it to be um, uh, under the 90-day mandate, then it has to be repeated. But how do we know it's repeated unless we okay. first record the first time it but happens? But my specific question is, are making verbal statements of a sexual nature, um, would you include that as sex abuse? It is under the sexual harassment or verbal. And you just said that, like, again, you went back to saying you look to see if there's recording of that language. No, not audio uh, language. We're looking for behavior on, uh, on the video. Okay. So when it comes to sexual abuse, you're looking for physical behavior. You are not looking for verbal behavior. Our genetic system is not equipped with audio devices. Okay, but again, when we talk about the preponderance of evidence and somebody makes a, 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 an accusation that they're experiencing verbal sexual abuse, you do not need an audio recording to reach a preponderance of the evidence. No, we will use the, the activity, the body language, they're, they're, they mention, you so know. So what you're telling me is that your system, your process does not in any way account for verbal sexual abuse. That's what you're Absolutely telling me. Absolutely, we do. The, you have, you just said. Under harassment. So you do not count, you would not count it as abuse, you would only count it as harassment. It's under the definition for the federal standards, okay. yes. I think that's a problem. Would you, would, would DOC consider asking um, a transgender or intersex person about the status of their genitalia as sexual abuse? We have someone to speak specifically on that issue. Um, good afternoon, Council Member Caban, um, Valerie Graysack, Assistant Commissioner in the Division of Programs and Community Partnerships. We do not ask questions about individuals' genitalia. No, 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 that's not, that's, that's, that's not what I'm saying. And listen, let me tell you that I was a public defender for nearly a decade. I speak to community members all the time. There are absolutely instances. I've heard it myself. I have heard it myself when corrections is moving people at the courthouse from the pens to their appearance. So it does happen, but that's not my question. My question is, when it does happen, does the Department of Corrections consider asking a transgender or intersex person about the status of their genitalia, sex abuse? That's not something that's part of our practice. If there's a specific so the answer instance no. when that happens, we'd be happy to look into it. It does happen, and what I'm hearing is that you do not consider it sex abuse. Do you consider it sexual harassment? Uh, that's something that would be up to the pre-investigation unit to determine what's considered sexual harassment or sexual assault. So an allegation of inappropriate comments, allegation of a uh, request to see a particular body, uh, body part that is not within the scope of the officer or whoever's um, duties is counted as sexual harassment and investigated. Uh, I'm just going to ask one more, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Chair. I, uh, this is actually about the, the, the bill that's being um, discussed today. Intro 830, it, it's still being discussed on this hearing, yeah? Okay, great. For Intro 830, it contemplates that the department will work with national experts to create these investigator trainings. I know that there were some um, questions about this. Uh, I'm going to ask it again. What national experts on preventing and investigating sexual assault is the department already in contact with? What are their names? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? 
So intro 830, it contemplates that the department would work with national experts to create investigator trainings, right? Like that is what the, the bill calls for. Um, so I'm wondering in this moment already, like what national experts on preventing and investigating sexual assaults is the department already in contact with? What are, what are their names? So we, we work with NIC, National Institute on Corrections, and I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a training that the Bureau of Justice Assistance is rolling out that we've been, we've been working with as well. Okay. One of our members um, will be part of an inaugural training. It's a 14-week training. Um, but uh, we've been working with our external partners in addition to NYPD and other. Okay. Other well, I'm just asking about the national. So you, yeah. you've listed two corrections organizations. Are any of the organizations LGBT, LGBTQIA plus organizations? I think NIC is. NIC. NIC is. Yeah. I'm sorry. Could you please require, repeat the question? Who, what national experts on preventing and investigating sexual assault is the Department of Corrections in contact with? And of those organizations, are any of them queer organizations? I'm not certain about training, but I do want to emphasize that as a department, uh, part of our priorities and goals uh, is to partner with organizations okay. that specifically serve the LGBTQ plus community. Again, again you're, you're, like, you're taking, I'm giving you a very specific question that is yes or no. You are throwing it away and then just throwing out like a really big broad blanket statement and it's, it's not a sufficient answer. So I'm just going to put that out there. I'm, but I, I just want to end by saying that I really do get very, very frustrated at a, a, a lot of the things that we hear in these hearings, but if ever there was a single piece of testimony to pinpoint and ground the problem that we are facing that is the subject of this hearing is to hear that inappropriate sexual behavior and relationships speak for themselves, goes without saying, we already know, we don't have to be told. That is the kind of mentality and lack of structure and support and services that ensures that people will continue to endure the kind of abuse that they are experiencing in custody right now. And I, I, I thought that was particularly abhorrent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Caban. Councilmember Narcisse. Um, good morning, and thank you, Chair. Good afternoon at this time, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to share a brief story. The reason that I, even though I'm very, I have to run in my district, I had to stay here because this is very serious. And I can share the fact that in high school, somebody was trying to get my chain inside my coat and they touched the area they should not be touched, that should not be touched by a stranger. And I was very upset and I had to spend almost two years washing it. So this is a very serious, this is, this is not a joke, especially for staff that expose and the folks that kind of like vulnerable, that they don't have no choice, they have to be a certain place at that time. Um, so follow up my colleagues, if everything based on evidence, right, to make a case. But I'm gonna go back to a question here, and if you can help me with that. DOI has recommended that jail cameras coverage be enhanced to correct for blind spots and extended to cover janitors, closet, and other closed rooms that officers can access with a person in custody. They also recommended that DOC should retain footage from each camera for one year. Have all these recommendations been implemented? That question was asked before. The reason I'm going back to it, so if evidence is based on evidence based on everything, not, ex, not all from what the person is saying, but the cameras will be a very, very important tool to have, especially to cover the blind spots. And from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, so you still have blind spots. You now have upgraded all the cameras, right? 
Have you? So, so at the time when that recommendation was presented, um, policies and procedures and recommendation was presented by DOI, the commissioner at the time, I'm assuming, did not accept all of those recommendations. That's why I said I, I have to go back and look at that, right? Because that was, the report was in 2018. We do not currently have um, cameras throughout all those areas. That's why we have a captain conducting the tours. But that's why I said I will go back and look at that recommendation and, and then sort of circle back with. So what my colleague's saying, that evidence we're talking about, if you don't have that for somebody that you're saying this is what happened and you don't have this important tools in place, that's a problem. And I just explained to you, it takes me two years because somebody just touched me because they were just grabbing a chain, not even for me. It was just the thing they were taking. Yeah, and it hurt me so much. Take two years, over two years, washing that spot. So this is serious. So can you walk me through when somebody make a complaint of sexual abuse, let's say sexual abuse. Can you walk me through that process? What happened? Okay, so multiple pat reporting pathways. And I'm gonna paint you a picture that consider an email as a, is the notification. The notification comes in to a PREA supervisors. It could be from another staff member, it could be from medical, it could be a 311 forwarded to us. Very minimal information. Um, person that called from such housing area claimed this. Sometimes they may have a date and time, sometimes it may have an, an aggressor name, sometimes it'll just say staff. The minute the supervisor, the prior supervisors reads this, it's immediately forwarded out to DOI just based on staff. We don't know a name, we don't know other particulars. That coincides with um, our mandate to also report corruption within the department. The, there's a DOI duty team, a weekly duty team, and within minutes to up to 24 hours, that DOI clearance is sent back to us. We, we start our mandated services, we generate separation orders. When we find out you know, where the, the, the victim is located, we will go out to where they are located. If they're at the hospital, if they're at uh, how, uh, facility, are they in the housing area? All of those factors are taken into, into account when we're dispatching our staff. Our staff arrive, taking in situation awareness, taking a look to see the type of housing area. Is there a, a confidential room that we can use? Maybe a grievance has a room in there. Is it a double tier housing area with a particular pantry that's to the uh, away from? Uh, view of other persons in, in the housing area. Those are the type of things that we look into to kind of gauge whether we can talk to that person in that housing area. Sometimes just just appearing in front of them and they may just say, I don't want to talk right now or I don't want to talk here. That kind of gives my investigators the, okay, well, let's, let's look further into this. Let's figure out can we take this person to the intake? Can we take this person? Maybe the chapel is available for an interview at this point. Taking into account, um, we now do a confidential uh, interview. Our investigators are compassionate in the manner that they conduct their interviews. They are careful not to re-victimize uh, the persons in custody. However, take into account that we do have to ask the hard questions sometimes. So I was taking a little bit aback of of back, um, with the previous question because we may, is not necessarily just because they're transgender we're asking for genitalia. We may be asking because it's necessary for the investigation, right? We'll ask those hard questions, what did it look like, right? It's not because they're transgender, it's because it's necessary to the investigation. Uh, maybe they had a mole, something, you know, that the victim can help us identify later on. So moving forward from there, um, we, all the information is collected. I want to make, uh, um, our investigators do not make any type of determination when they're out in the field. They are collecting all the information, business records, canvases, interviews, medical uh, injury report, and taking that back to the office to a supervisor that makes a determination for it to be a decision whether it's reported incident or not. Okay. And which phase did the doctor get involved, the medical team get involved? 
how long in the hours? Give me hours into. I'm not sure of hours, depending on, on the reporting pathway. Because if it's pathway. physical abuse. So depending on the reporting pathway, if we received it from CHS, because we're assuming they went to uh, CHS already, based on the coordinated response, mm -hmm. um, if the person in custody or the victim made it to a staff member, they can go ahead and get medical attention prior to an investigator reaching them. Um, I think I have one more thing that I just wrote in here that I did, I forgot. Um, just one second at the last one. Mm -hmm. Is there um, a regular review or audit process to ensure that abuse and harassment reports among staff are addressed transparently and fairly? You're referring to, to staff? Staff? Staff. Now it's staff. As victim? Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay, um, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, AC McCormick, but with respect to um, the staff, if, if there's an incident, if there's assault on staff, there's something that's documented, the department is a, we're aware, uh, department leadership is a, made aware in real time, um, and uh, at, during that time we will typically reach out to our Correctional Intelligence Bureau and they will meet with the staff member to determine if they want to press charges. Um, sometimes they move forward, sometimes they don't. But that's something, once there's an assault on staff, anything happening throughout the facility, it is documented in real time. And our care unit will go and meet with that staff member to provide them with the support that they need. But that is something throughout our facility that we are aware when it happens. I mean, just recently we had, unfortunately, um, an incident, but the chief, Chief Rembert, she actually went and she met with the staff member just to, to see how she was doing after that incident. Okay. Um, I don't know if AC McCormick, you wanna talk yeah, about Yeah, just to add to that, Commissioner, it um, doesn't matter if it's a physical assault or sexual assault, uh, the paperwork and the proper notifications are made immediately. And for the resources, starting at the facility level, the leadership, We'll reach out to the employee um, in conjunction with their unions, the care unit. Um, uh, we're continually supporting the staff member on the initial report, whether it's physical or a sexual assault. I'm gonna leave it with this. We need to make correction because this is serious. And on top of it, mentally, it's very important to get support throughout. And I would like to know do you follow up if somebody kind of, let's say even for staff, um, what do you do? Do you follow up mentally to make sure they refer to organization? Because that's a trauma that you're dealing probably for the rest of your life. Absolutely. I want you to understand and, that. And I can tell you just even working in corrections, there's a lot of trauma and you're right about that. We also um, refer individuals to the employee assistance program so that they have those resources. But, you know, I... I think there's a lot more work that we can do and we're exploring how we can be more helpful and thoughtful because really and truly everyone needs to be safe in our jails and it's a priority especially with trauma and mental health because the reality is if our staff aren't poured into if they're not well they they, they don't have anything to give so we have to really make it a priority and i agree with uh council member stevens I'm not just talking, I've worked at the department for the last nine years and I see what they go through firsthand and we have to make it a priority. A lot of, a lot of organizations, a lot of people don't prioritize uh, correction officers and correction staff, but we're gonna do it internally and make sure that they are a priority. We don't have no choice, is this in New York City? If we cannot lead by example, and make sure we address the basic things that we need to do, protect people's safety. It's exactly. very, very important. It is. And I will, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna leave it with that. As a nurse for over three decades, experience, life experience, doing re-entry program, I know firsthand that's the reason I have to say thank you to Chair that we're taking it seriously because we are part of that community that being affected a lot of time. We have to deal with this um, trauma. So let me, just, back let me just say on the record, I mean, thank you. there's a lot of experience here and I'm happy to work with all of you so we can address this issue. Thank you, I appreciate your time, thanks. Thank you, Council Member Narcisse. <clears throat> I'm gonna turn to the Adult Survivor Act lawsuits. 
In preparation for this hearing, we reviewed over 30 lawsuits that contained allegations of sexual assaults that occurred on Rikers Island within the past six years. I have some general questions about some patterns that emerged when looking at these cases. On May 30th, 2023, a lawsuit was filed in the Bronx County Supreme Court that alleged that a correction officer sexually abused a woman housed at the Rose M. Singer Center in the spring of 2020. In the complaint, the woman, who also bravely recounted her story to the press, alleged that a correction officer selected her for a special work assignment, and then, while isolated in a social service office, this officer held her down, sexually assaulted her, and threatened retaliation if she reported the abuse. The officer who was specifically named in the lawsuit apparently remained employed and still posted at Rosie's nearly a month after the first case was filed. It's safe to assume this because another woman alleges that the same officer forced her to perform sexual acts against her will in an abandoned office. When the first lawsuit was filed, the department should have been on notice that an officer they employed had been accused of sexual assault. If some measure of precautionary action at that point, it stands to reason that further harm could have been prevented. I, want, I, I won't ask you to comment about the specifics of the case because I know you're gonna tell me that you can't, but in general, when a lawsuit is filed that alleges an officer currently employed by the department committed sexual abuse, does the law department notify DOC? Just yes or no. Yes. So if you are informed about the lawsuit, you get information from the law department when cases are filed, then why would someone still be posted in the facility, at a women's facility, nearly months, uh, it, months it's, later? I'm sorry, it's difficult to answer that question without discussing the specifics, but we do review with law and internally now any of those types of allegations. Um, we, we stated at the last hearing that there were movements on, on those individuals. Um, again, beyond that, I can't go too much further, but um, it's something that we're looking into as a processes uh, for us more robustly, given, again, the scope and, and the number of laws. And I, I need to get more of a, a, a timeline to understand. The email comes in, or you get a call, you get notified. That goes to a who? The, the legal division. Totally okay, yes. and then what does the legal division do as soon as they get that email? These series of lawsuits, so it's different now, we haven't received any, you know, on a one-off basis since the um, kind of bulk of the, these uh, adult survivor acts lawsuits came in. So I can't specifically comment on like what the processes did. You can say that a theoretical email comes in, that person gets it, what is their next course of action? That would come directly to me, and then I would confer with the commissioner and the executive staff right. on the next step. So in a situation like this, we can assume that the law department says, hey, there's a case against this person. They're at Rosie's. You get this, commissioner. Then what is your course of action? Then I would remove that individual from that facility okay. based on the allegations. So do you have an explanation of why someone would be there for a month, over a month after notif getting notified? So uh, let me just say, because I'm an attorney as well, e even though someone files a lawsuit, it does not necessarily mean that we get notice of the lawsuit at the time of filing. So upon receiving the lawsuit and reviewing the allegations, then we take steps, right? But not because someone files a lawsuit on a specific day means that we know simultaneously as the case is being filed. It goes directly to the law department and then the law department will assign it to the agency. Um, when I was in the legal division, I personally reviewed all these complaints coming in um, and assigned the, ca the cases to specific attorneys. If, if there was a specific plaintiff, in, you know, to ensure that the attorney was dealing with those cases with respect to that plaintiff, that one attorney would be assigned to those cases. But I looked at the allegations of the complaint. If there was an issue, then I would escalate it, like this is, this is what this case is saying. And I believe that process is still taking place. But once, once, we, once the case is filed, we don't necessarily get it right away. But upon receipt, we take action. What's an average time? 
it's an difficult. average timeline between receiving a notification of some kind of accusation to going down to the facility and reassigning that person or taking them off the floor. Again, we haven't experienced that situation because we haven't had that since the mass filings of the ASA lawsuits. So we can't give a specific timeline now what we anticipate given, again, the robustness of these lawsuits and what's going forward is that it would be immediate. I would convey that as soon as I receive word of it, we'd convey it to the commissioner and then, again, we'd take appropriate action. We can't say, again, retroactively now because that was a unique circumstance. I will say just along the commissioner's lines, I, I did this at the NYPD, from not, not with ASA lawsuits, but I mean lawsuits in general. There's somewhat of a trend in, in the plaintiff's litigation where they will file a lawsuit and serve the officers individually and then wait to serve the law department until a considerable time later in order to start to develop default motions and otherwise. Uh -huh. So that, that creates this weird dynamic of the timing of the filing to when we actually get notice of it. Okay. So, uh, but nonetheless, again, going forward, this is our process. I can't go backwards on these bulk lawsuits. We, we talked about what has happened since then, but this is our processes now since I'm in place. Understood. And, and in this instance, which I'm not going to ask you to speak specifically on, but if we were to come back in a year after maybe some motion has happened and more stuff becomes um, public, and we were to look at the timeline between when you were notified and when that person was removed from tour, do you think we would be outraged or we would feel like there was swift action taken? I, I think we'd be transparent about it, um, though I could say that, again, as, as the commissioner mentioned, there's a processes to, to hash out all allegations. We would take action in circumstances where we also do a review ourselves. I mean, and again, with immediacy. Oh, I know. I'm just trying to but ask. I'm, I'm asking you to, 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 it's a, to it's say, a, like, do you think when we find out how long it took between notification and the person being removed, that when we come back and find that out, you think we're going to be like, they did their job really well? I, I, I have to tell you, Chair, sometimes it's hard to predict how the council will react to what we do. We anticipate that we will have this system. I think we system. react just sensibly to an accusation of sexual well, assault. And that's what I'm saying. We will, we will certainly... Credit on the floor. I'm sorry, I, I, I was speaking over you. Could you repeat that? What I'm saying is we're, at, we're reacting appropriately. Okay. And we would react appropriately. But you're asking me how you're going to react in a year. I can't predict that. But we anticipate that we... Not anticipate, we are implementing the system of immediacy. I'm taking this to say that that you think you did it well, and we hope that that's the case. Um, in another case reported on by the news outlet Gothamist, the department uh, should have been notified of a sexual assault allegation against a correction officer when a case was filed on November 17, 2023. However, nearly seven months later, the department confirmed in a press report that the officer who, again, was specifically named in the lawsuit was still employed and working at Rosie's. At our hearing last month, we were happy to learn that all of the officers named in the sexual, suit lawsuits are, sexual assault lawsuits are no longer serving at Rosie's. However, during this extended lag time, at least in one instance, seven months went on before deciding to reassign the officer accused of sexual assault and potentially other women were in danger. I'm sorry, is that a question? It is, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I'll ask you a question. Why was it seven months? When did you get notification and why was it seven months before somebody I, I was I was reassigned? not with the department at the time. Okay. Um, is so there anyone else here who can speak to that? The previous general counsel is not with this department no, anymore. I'm saying so is there know. anyone here in this room that can, that can speak to before your time? I mean, once we... I, I, again, I, I, without speaking to the specific, specifics of that case, there was this, again, from time of filing to time of notice of the lawsuit, I can't testify as to when we received notice specifically of those lawsuits. And then again, was, there was a series of incidents that occurred, as you're aware, after do that. You think, do you that, think, uh, so, so I'm gonna assume that it didn't take seven months, that I'm gonna assume that the law department gave you this information as soon as they got it, and that that information was received by the prior person and then I imagine some, there was a period, there was seven months time. So the team, I, I, again, I don't want to belabor the point too much about the processes, but the team that I work with now on this specific issue is actually headed by the person who was acting general counsel prior to us. So she is now back in place within the law department to have this communication. What was happening then is that unit that she was in was a little less robust and, and operational. 
So I can't, again, can't speak specifically as to the notification process from when this was filed to then. I know what we are doing now and what the communication is between us and the law department and what we are committed to with the commissioner and ourselves moving forward in that. Okay. It seems like, I understand you're not gonna be able to answer the question, but during this period where these accusations were coming online and we were starting to get reporting about it, um, you're saying there, you're saying there was a turnover in staff or there was some kind of uh, transition period, you're coming on, other people, do you think there was a communication breakdown? I, I don't know that we could say it's a communication breakdown, as indicated, um, because of the very small time that the Adult Survivors Act window was open for filing, um, again, or what was anticipated, there was a huge amount of this. So it took some time, I think, even for the law department to establish the scope of and the years of the uh, defendants and, and the universe of where these cases came from. We heard some testimony earlier that these are from 40 years ago in some circumstances. Um, once we identified, and again, I can't comment on the specific timing of it, once we identified the five that were active still, um, that was addressed, again, during my tenure and otherwise. So I can't say communication breakdown, but again, going forward, th this is affirmatively remedied. Um, for this issue that we're speaking about. Okay, I still would argue that seven months is an, a significant amount of time. It's not a small window um, for someone to still be on, on a, in a housing unit or in working in a women's facility. Um, some lawsuits that we reviewed involve fairly detailed descriptions of an alleged perpetrator named only as CO John Doe or CO J Jane Doe. For example, in one case filed by a woman alleged to have been assaulted at Rosie's in 2021, the alleged abuser was described as a short, heavyset Hispanic male in around his 40s who delivered food to inmates. If DOC receives information that a lawsuit was filed against an anonymous officer described in a legal complaint, will the department take any steps to investigate the claim and see if they can ascertain the officer's identity? Uh, we, we have to, in the legal division at least, have to work with the law department in, you know, in order to identify John Doe and Jane Doe officers nonetheless. So in that vein, we affirmatively reach out to investigation due or otherwise to try to backtrack where, you know, what was the timing, what was the tour, what was the uh, assignment, and then again, the description. So that's a requirement that we have to, you know, uh, again, uh, cooperate with the law department. So it is also part of, uh, you know, our internal processes. So the answer, there was a long-winded uh, yes, but that's why we, we do that for multiple, uh, multiple reasons. Thank you. One second. Um, I'm going to ask you about some staffing issues. Uh, safe housing with sufficiently trained and well-supervised staff must be provided for vulnerable populations. Lack of supervisory rounds plays a central role in allowing abuse by, abuse by staff to take place. If staff know that there is a period of time when no round is likely to occur, abuse uh, will occur undetected. BOC standards require supervisors to conduct rounds at varied and unpredictable times. How does the department monitor whether supervisors meet this requirement? So the investigation is twofold. Our PREA compliance unit collects all the business records, identify a particular housing area, um, and 24 hours of business records and video is preserved, reviewed, um, staff identified, so on and so forth. That investigation is then passed on to my unit, and I have four investigators assigned to the unannounced rounds investigation, and we literally match the business record to our um, uh, electronic monitoring system, right? So we, we check to see that the staff member actually on video conducted the type of tour that they are signing onto our business records onto the logbook saying that they conducted those tours. Those tours I mentioned earlier were for detection, are important to look for those hidden spaces for those um, areas that should be locked. Um, the, uh, into the showers, again, very sensitive, make sure that um, cross-gender, we announce ourselves going into the, the shower, letting them know that we're walking in for the purpose of a tour. Um, 
during the review, if we find that a staff member did not complete a tour, that information is documented in disciplinary as far as a facility referral, meaning we hold the facility um, leadership responsible for that, um, for that staff member to get uh, internal charges. Thank you. DOI has issued several policy and procedure recommendations that were aimed at dramatically reducing opportunities for sexual misconduct to occur. One recommendation was that DOC should require that officers escort people in custody in male and female pairs in order to reduce opportunities for sexual misconduct. DOI also recommended that DOC policy should be revised to ensure the people in custody assigned to work details at Rosie's are supervised by at least two members of staff, including one female employee at all times. Why were these recommendations rejected? Like I mentioned earlier, this predates me in terms of um, accepting or, or rejecting recommendations, but I'll take a look at that um, report and um, revisit the report and, and determine whether or not I should accept those recommendations. Okay. Do you think on the face of it, it would, it would make sense as a recommendation? Well, I have to, I will have to, I would have to look at it, honestly. Okay. It seems like it's providing more eyes and, and, and accountability. Yeah, but it also, we can, if we can be, utilize a body-worn camera, like, you know, there are other things that can be done, you know, in terms of adding additional personnel that we may not necessarily have. So I have to take a look at it and, and make a determination based on that review. An expert hired in a lawsuit filed by the Legal Aid Society found that permitting male correction officers to guard female inmates without supervision violates correctional best practices. Do you uh, agree or disagree with that assessment? That it violates best correctional practices? That, uh, I'll restate it, I, I'm trying to speak slow for, for myself as well, because um, I know these are, uh, these questions have a lot of preamble, but an expert hired in a lawsuit filed by the Legal Aid Society found that permitting male correction officers to guard female inmates without supervision violates correctional best practices. Do you agree or disagree with that assessment? Well, I think everybody should be subject to supervision, but I don't think because a correction, office, a correction officer is male and the individual in custody is female that that's, that inherently is a problem but I do agree that there needs to be constant supervision throughout our facilities, which is why we're doing the pre-announced tours and making sure that supervisors are doing the tours that are required. Yeah, I understand. I mean, I think in, I mean, look, I think you and I get up every day and walk in the world. We, we know that the, the, the chances of, I mean, I'd be curious to see the breakdown of these cases between uh, folks who've made allegations how many of them were against a male correction officer versus a woman correction officer, although there was testimony today about uh, sexual violence uh, being conducted by a female correction officer. Male captain. Um, I do think probably the statistics would show that more likely than not it was a male, to, a male correction officer to a female person in custody or a woman, a person who identifies as a woman in custody. Um, okay. I have a few other questions here, um, and then we have questions for DOI. We haven't really talked much about correctional health, although um, many of the allegations were around correctional health during um, medical checks, um, a lot of uh, instances of groping, penetration against their will, things like that. I, I did read your testimony, I, I heard your testimony, and we'll account for that. Um, but we do want to talk about um, the issue of deadlocking. I know it's not directly in uh, on topic for today's hearing, but we are we want to do we want to have a hearing around that. But we always bring up questions that are, are more timely and urgent. Um, the report that came out earlier this month, as a result of a whistleblower and a former CHS uh, service employee, uh, described a pattern of organized cruelty in which people in custody with a mental health diagnosis were routinely deadlocked or kept isolated in their cells and left to um, suffer for sometimes months at a time. Um, for, for Commissioner, um, you have been an employee of the Department of Corrections for nearly 10 years. During your tenure, have you ever heard the term deadlocking? I have not. 
You've never heard of this term? I've never heard of the term, oh. in all honesty. And so let me just tell you, those are extremely um, disturbing allegations. Mm -hmm. And upon hearing it, upon reading the article, I personally called the inspector general and forwarded that matter for them to review. So that is currently under the Department of Investigations review. I've also made it abundantly clear that that is against our policy. I've sent out communication uh, department wide that it is against our policy, and we have communicated in several meetings that it is for prohibited and that it should not proceed. So that is something that you know DOI is reviewing it, and we will you know we wait we wait to have the um, results of that investigation. But I have personally never heard that term. Okay. I, when I went to visit, um, uh, when we did an oversight tour, I, one of the white shirts there, and actually I'm, I'm, I'm an older gentleman who clearly had been working there for a long time, actually said it was a, a common term used. And he said that, uh, yeah, it's an, a terminology we've been using for, for a long, long time. Um, so I'm surprised, given how long you've been working there, that you've never heard of it. You ever heard um, of it? I had, I had not shared nurse. Um, also, I'm only here, you know, several months. I haven't not heard it. But uh, what was brought up at the Board of Correction meeting also was that there is a, a colloquial term for as uh, deadlocking, which is, I think, in the facilities used to represent where a an, a, uh, a person in custody is out of their cell and they lock the cell to prevent theft and other interference with with the. Uh, you know, the, the property of, of that person in custody. So that is used, and, and both the Board of Correction members um, had that worked and were um, in the system had recognized that term in that context, um, but otherwise we had not. Okay. And I know you said you referred this out for investigation. So are you doing any internal investigation? Well, we, we, we I, I and just to clarify no, for the record. No, okay. because I, because and especially hearing that it's been going on since 2017, I referred it to DOI. Okay. Okay. Um, I have questions for DOI. We're going to switch out the panel. Um, thank you all for, for being here, for testifying and answering questions. We're actually going to take like a five minute break. I don't know what they're going to. No, I think we should. We're not required to be here. I just. Oh, you have it? But I don't think they're going to be asking about the staffing for DOI. I think they want to know, like, those recommendations where what we did with the, um, what did we do with the cameras?
Okay, we're gonna pick back up. Um, this is our second panel. We're gonna hear from Commissioner Jocelyn Strauber. Strauber? Okay, from the Department of Investigation. Uh, Commissioner, if you can please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Noting for the record that the witness answered affirmatively, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jocelyn Strauber, and I serve as the commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. Thank you, Chair Nurse, uh, for the opportunity to discuss with you DOI's oversight role with respect to sexual abuse and sexual harassment in the New York City Department of Correction facilities. The allegations of sexual abuse of women in the custody of DOC facilities by DOC correction officers set forth in over 700 lawsuits filed earlier this year are horrifying. The city has a responsibility to keep safe all persons within DOC custody, and the decades-long abuse alleged, if true even in part, reflects that the city has failed to meet that responsibility. DOI plays an active role in responding to and investigating allegations that DOC, or Correctional Health Services, CHS, staff have sexually abused persons in custody. DOI receives and reviews all complaints of such abuse, conducts investigations, and when there is sufficient evidence of criminality, makes referrals to prosecuting agencies. For reasons that I will describe in a moment, these types of cases can be challenging to investigate, DOI is committed to assisting DOC in its mission to eradicate sexual abuse in the city's jails. Where DOC or CHS seeks to discipline or terminate an employee as a result of a sexual abuse or misconduct investigation, DOI provides the relevant agency with information from our investigative file and assists their efforts as needed. DOI also has made over 30 recommendations to DOC in the past decade to improve DOC policies and procedures that are designed to prevent abuse. The Prison Rape Elimination Act of 2003, or PREA, established federal mandates to define and eliminate rape in correctional facilities across the United States. In 2012, the Department of Justice adopted national standards to prevent, detect, and respond to prison rape under PREA. In 2016, the Board of Correction implemented sexual abuse and harassment minimum standards, which mirror the PREA standards and outline the responsibility of DOC to prevent, detect, and respond to prison sexual abuse and harassment. In 2016, DOC promulgated Directive 5011, which was subsequently updated in 2019 to establish specific policies and procedures to comply with the PREA mandate of zero tolerance toward all forms of sexual abuse and sexual harassment in its facilities. Directive 5011 also lays out the coordinated response to allegations of sexual assault and sexual harassment by DOC and DOI, and sets forth DOI's investigative role. Broadly speaking, DOI's mandate includes investigating and referring for criminal prosecution cases of fraud, waste, abuse, corruption, and other illegal activities by city employees contractors, and others who do business with the city. We also identify systemic corruption vulnerabilities and recommend improvements to reduce the city's exposure to fraud, waste, abuse, and corruption, and to improve the functioning of city agencies. With respect to DOC specifically, DOI's investigations focus on identifying, investigating, and eliminating destabilizing forces in the city's jail facilities, including contraband smuggling by officers as well as bribery of officers by persons in custody, use of excessive force, and sexual abuse and sexual harassment cases involving DOC staff. Directive 5011 establishes DOI's role and involvement in PREA investigations. In that procedure, DOI is clearly defined as the New York City agency responsible for investigating staff on persons in custody sexual abuse or sexual harassment. Both persons in custody and staff are encouraged to report alleged sexual abuse or harassment of persons in custody through DOI's 24-hour hotline or DOC's internal PREA hotline. Complaints received by DOC must be reported to DOI. Section 6B of Directive 5011 states that DOI 
shall conduct investigations for sexual misconduct that involve staff on persons in custody allegations or allegations that involve alleged rape cases. After a preliminary review of the facts, DOI may elect to have the investigation conducted by SIU, DOC's Internal Special Investigations Unit. Within 24 hours of receiving a complaint of sexual abuse of a person in custody by a DOC staff member, DOI will conduct an initial assessment. On the basis of that initial assessment, DOI will determine whether it will open an investigation or whether it will clear DOC to conduct a preliminary investigation. DOC is instructed not to take any investigatory steps until DOI has made such an assessment, and the level of review that DOI undertakes as part of that initial assessment depends on a number of factors, including the level of detail and information provided in the complaint. When determining whether to, convince, to, com to commence an investigation itself or whether to clear DOC to conduct a preliminary investigation, DOI's considerations include whether the complaint provides sufficient factual information, such as the names of the persons involved in the time and place of the incident, whether the alleged abuser has been the subject of similar allegations in the past, whether physical conduct, if any, is described or detailed in the complaint. Of course, as with all investigations, DOI considers its available resources in determining which investigations to commence. Moreover, because of the proximity to, of SIU to DOC facilities and its dedicated team of PREA investigators, SIU is often better equipped to immediately respond when a PREA allegation is reported. If DOI clears the complaint for SIU to investigate, DOI explicitly instructs SIU to immediately notify DOI if SIU's investigation uncovers evidence of potentially criminal behavior. If so, DOI will take over that investigation. Currently, approximately 23 investigators are assigned to DOI's Squad 1, that's the unit responsible for overseeing DOC. 12 members of the staff are correction officers and captains detailed to DOI from DOC. Of the total 23 investigators that we have, 17 have received PREA investigations training and may be assigned to investigate allegations of sexual abuse by DOC staff. A number of investigators have also attended various additional trainings relating specifically to the investigation of sex crimes. In total, for calendar years 22, 23, and 24, as of October 24th of this year, DOI has received 3,022 complaints of sexual misconduct at DOC facilities. These complaints include all allegations of sexual misconduct, regardless of the alleged perpetrator or victim, and, th and therefore include not only allegations of abuse of persons in custody by staff, but abuse of staff by staff, and abuse of persons in custody by other persons in custody. These complaints come from sources including referrals from DOC, calls to the city's 311 hotline, and DOI's own complaint line, email, and website. Since 2022 to the present, DOI has opened 28 investigations, 20 of which involve allegations of abuse of persons in custody by staff. Investigations of sexual misconduct in city jail facilities present unique challenges, which can limit the effectiveness of our investigations. As with other incidents of sexual violence, victims may be hesitant to come forward or, having submitted a complaint, cooperate with an investigation out of shame or fear. These concerns are particularly acute in a custodial setting where the victims may be in daily contact with the alleged perpetrator and their coworkers. Victims in custody, as well as witnesses who are in custody, may be suspicious or afraid of law enforcement and reluctant to cooperate for that reason. And because areas of these facilities where assaults might occur lack video cameras, corroborating or additional evidence can be difficult to obtain. Since the BOC standards went into effect in 2017, DOI has investigated approximately 58 complaints of staff on persons in custody, sexual abuse, or harassment, and made three arrests. In addition, DOI also made two arrests for staff-on-staff -staff sexual misconduct. 
When DOI has conducted an investigation of sexual abuse by DOC or CHS staff and obtains sufficient evidence of criminal sexual conduct, DOI refers the matter to a prosecutor's office, state or federal. DOI works closely with that office to investigate further and to prosecute the case. If there is not sufficient evidence of criminal conduct, DOI refers the matter to DOC or CHS for whatever action the respective agency deems appropriate based on the facts developed by DOI's investigation, which can include disciplinary action, and collaborates with DOC or CHS on any further investigative steps and provides support in any administrative proceeding as needed. Since 2022, DOI has made 31 referrals to DOC and CHS for discipline of staff as a result of substantiated allegations of sexual misconduct for both staff on person in custody and staff on staff conduct. Policy and procedure recommendations, known as PPRs, are a critical part of DOI's responsibility to reduce the risk of fraud and corruption by strengthening internal controls and oversight within the city. Therefore, when investigating complaints of sexual abuse within DOC facilities, DOI considers whether improvements to DOC policies and procedures could reduce the risk of this misconduct or make it easier to detect and prevent. Since 2014, DOI has issued 35 PPRs related to sexual abuse or sexual harassment in the city's jails, including recommendations such as expanding the use of video cameras in DOC facilities, and other measures to ensure that DOC holds officers accountable when sexual misconduct does take place. Of those 35 PPRs, 22 have been accepted, one has been partially accepted, eight have been rejected, and four are awaiting a response from DOC. Of the 23 that have been fully or partially accepted, DOC reports that 19 have been implemented. The recent filing of hundreds of lawsuits alleging sexual assault in the city's jails, as well as DOI's ongoing work on a number of sexual abuse investigations, calls for continuing active efforts to identify areas of vulnerability in DOC's policies and procedures, and to consider whether additional improvements can be made, as well as continued engagement with DOC on outstanding PPRs. DOI shares DOC's commitment to eradicate sexual abuse and harassment of persons in custody by DOC staff. We will continue to deploy our investigative and policy and procedural expertise in service of this critical mission. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about these issues today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I have some, I have a few questions, not that many, as I mentioned, but um, I did have a, a little bit of a preliminary one, probably for my um, education and awareness. Um, you said you have 23 investigators that are assigned to DOI's Squad 1 that's responsible for overseeing DOC, and the 12 of them are correction officers and captains detailed to you all from DOC. Um, I, I guess, I'm, I, and you also mentioned that, you know, people might be suspicious or afraid of law enforcement and reluctant to cooperate. Are those folks who are COs um, and captains ever interacting um, in, in following up in these investigations with people who might have made uh, uh, complaints or allegations? Yes, they would be included in the staff who respond to PREA allegations. Okay. And, and just to be clear, they are detailed through an arrangement that we have with DOC, but they report up through the DOI chain. They are, you know, full DOI investigators. Okay. Um, How and long yes, are they, they are normally detailed with you. I'm sorry? How long are they detailed with you? Uh, there's no set time limit, so it's not like they rotate in and out on a regular basis through our arrangement with DOC. They can remain sometimes until a promotion where whether they will stay or not will be revisited depending on our needs and DOC's needs. Um, and through our MOU, if there are reasons for them to be recalled to DOC, that can happen. But, but they're not on sort of a rotating, very limited time period or anything like that. Okay, like on average, do people stay with you for like a year, a couple years, or is it like a more, um, you know, I would say a it's, a, it's a few years okay. or more for most people. And are they in uniform by chance when they're interacting with these folks? Oh, sorry. 
No, they're they're not in DOC uniform. Okay, just, I'm asking because I don't. I, I'm just. No, and I was I was plans. looking back to check with our okay. acting inspector general, which can confirm my my understanding that they're not in they're not in uniform. They may be wearing clothing that identify them in some way, depending on their particular assignment that day as DOI employees, but they're not wearing sort of DOC uniforms. No. So if they were to interact with someone who's filed an allegation in the invest and they're in the investigation follow up or in the process somewhere, would that person know that this person? Um, is is a correction officer? Not necessarily, no. Got it. So as, as was just explained, they would know that they're an investigator. Now they may give their title. Their title would be captain. So in that sense, they, they would be identifying themselves as part of, you know, as, as, right. as a corrections employee. Okay. That's not, uh, this that is, doesn't happen in yeah, every interaction. Yeah, I understand. I'm just curious what the visibility of that is to someone wh who might have made an accusation and now they're getting an investigator come that, you know, I, I, I think that there might be, it's interesting. It's interesting to learn about this um, because I just, I, I wonder the, how effective it can really be. As if, if you work for, a, if you're a correction officer and you know that at some point you might go back, you might be promoted up back at DOC, these are your, these are your people. Like these are the people you rock with, you have a union, you know, there, there is, um, as someone who grew up in a military uh, and, and knows what it means for people in uniform and how they really like lock ranks on each other and hold each other, um, it could be a situation where there's a lot of space for um, problematic activity, is what I would say. So I mean, I think it's, it's I, I totally take your point and understand the concern. I will say that these are, with our other you know, DOI investigators, the officers that prosecute our cases and make arrests for contraband, um, that are you know, part of the fact-finding investigations that result in disciplinary referrals. So we certainly have not seen and would not tolerate any investigators within DOI who we felt were not aligned with our mission but were actually there to protect fellow officers. And we have not, we have not seen that, but I certainly take your point that any identification associating someone with the corrections office could be concerning to a victim. I don't think we've had that experience in, yeah. you know, but, but, I, but I certainly understand the point. Or it might be question. unknown to you all Correct. because of the nature of it. But I, I guess I'm wondering, um, I guess, yeah, I'm just curious why the, the history of why, why COs in there, why not just civilian staff doing sure. investigations as opposed to people who might be detailed out for a year or two and then come back, you know, biding their time. I'm really curious why it wouldn't just be uh, civilian staff that are, you know, trained investigators. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And we have, we have different arrangements throughout the agency in terms of, um, sort of what we call on loan staff um, that are employees of other agencies. So we don't have that in all of our squads, but we have it in, in many squads, not just DOC. The, the benefits of it um, are having officers who really understand mm -hmm. the internal workings of an agency, not just from an oversight perspective, and it's our obligation to understand all the agencies we oversee, but from an entity that's sort of as complex and multifaceted as DOC, we have found it helpful to have officers who have worked uh, in the facilities themselves. And for the most part, although I can't give you sort of for each officer that we have, these are folks who are in within DOC, many of whom have had have, have worked in the capacity as investigators. So, you know, th that's that their work in DOC has been to investigate misconduct within DOC. We heard a lot earlier about DOC's own ability to do that through SIU, et cetera. Yeah. No, I'll move on from this point. I, I mean, I think arguably you could get that same kind of insight and expertise from, you know, someone who's not potentially going to go back, um, you know, or who's just like temporarily assigned for a, a year or two. Like, this is a person who's no longer there and recruiting from that pool of, of people um, to to be that inside knowledge, that institutional knowledge that you're looking for in these other 12 folks that are, um, I, it just seems like there could be some ways to get around it. I mean, you're saying you haven't had something specific, but maybe we don't know, and I, under, I take you for your word at that. Um, okay, so, I mean, we're, we're here because of the adult survivor acts and, and the lawsuits that have been filed. 
um, it's my understanding that DOI has the discretion to begin a large scale investigation of any city agency, against any city agency at any time it wants to. Um, and given what you've learned, are you all considering um, looking at this in a, in a very large scale way and whether there are systemic problems at DOC that is resulting in high rates of sexual violence over the years? So, so we are considering that. And to be clear, as we do, and we do have a number of ongoing investigations of sexual misconduct, we are not just focused, even in those cases, on the individual acts. We are also thinking about the bigger picture and the recommendations that we have made to date you know, certainly highlight that. Um, I think the question is, is, is what and how best to address the sort of overwhelming number of very serious allegations, you know, that have been made recently, and whether we should be doing something bigger and more comprehensive is something that we are thinking about. Um, one issue that we do have to be mindful of when we think as a practical matter, how are we going to go about doing this, is our staffing limitations. and and. You know, so that is, uh, that is just a consideration that we have to address. And so I, I don't want to say that we have decided that we're going to be doing something, and we certainly don't have a, a firm decision and a plan of action. But absolutely, I agree that what we're seeing in these allegations warrants a sort of broader question about whether our approach should be or could be more comprehensive, which you know, then leads to the question of how would we efficiently and effectively do that with the resources that we have. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why we're having this hearing is because we just, it feels like we haven't seen that kind of five alarm fire response from the city, you know, in the converse, and I'm, I, I realize you're the only one here and it wasn't the big dais, so, uh, or dais, um, but you know, the mayor, when, when asked about these things, he's like, oh, these happened a long time ago. Um, and you know, it just, yeah, it just really feels like we're not, putting um, all in, like all hands on deck situation to be like, this is a, this is a crisis. Um, I think Council Member Stevens called it an epidemic, both in our juvenile detention facilities and here. And, you know, the council has specific sets of powers it has, but really this comes down from the executive of the city saying, holy shit, this happened. I'm now in charge. I signed up to inherit these problems. Like, I got to put resources toward this. Um, so I think, you know, I certainly would advocate for DOI to take this on as a large scale investigation because of, you know, obviously the, the stories we heard today, the trauma that's ongoing, the young people who are being sexually violated um, in, in, in facilities that are run by the city. Um, do you all know when you will be able to make that decision about whether or not you will do it? I mean, I don't have a specific time frame to, to give you. It's something that we're considering. I think the question of resources is a very significant one. What kind of resources would you need for it? I need additional people. I mean, if we're going to How many? Well, that, see, that's, that, that would. The list. We'd love to champion That, that would have to follow from, from a, a, a plan that has particular components. Okay. We would also want to liaise with DOC to find out what they're doing so that, and we've heard something today about what they're planning on doing so we're not you know, overlapping and we're using the limited resources appropriately. Um, but, but I think if, if we were to take this on as sort of a large scale comprehensive project, I would need more resources to do that. Exactly how many, you know, I would, I would have to come back to you on that. Well, we'd love to work with you on that. I mean, I, I know that DOI isn't my committee, but I would be happy to um, stand outside and, and, and shout it from the mountaintop to get you the resources you need to take this on because it is so, uh, it's, it's so egregious. I'm happy to and, continue that conversation. I certainly think it's worthy. I, I just yeah. have to be realistic about what I can do with what I have. Okay. You want to ask it? You want to ask it? Um, thank you for being here, um, and I think even as we're thinking about this, and because I guess like I'm on this committee and my committee and, and all the things that's happening and just thinking about the investigation and, and as you're putting it together, just trying to propose and think of this would make sense of allowing more around like sexual assault in general and looking at it more comprehensively in the system and maybe having an investigation in that since we know that this is happening and some of the, well, has happened and happening in the juvenile, just, um, juvenile centers and rackers and things like that and thinking about something more 
comprehensive because I'm always thinking about like what makes the most sense. And also we all know that we don't have, a, well we do have an abundance of resources. The problem is they like us to think we don't. But thinking about how do we work together to try to put something comprehensive in and then having an actual budget acts ready for us to, me and, and nurse, to fight to, to get in the budget. I think last year the only person who was out there advocating for DOI was um, Council Member Brewer, but that's because if there's no acts and it's not being brought to us, we don't know. And I know for an agency like yours, it gets hard because a lot of times advocates are the ones pushing a lot of the, the things, but I think especially how do you use all of the council members to kind of support the, the things that you need in order for your agency to operate efficiently and getting the support that you need. So that was just, I guess it wasn't a question, but it was just like a, a, a proposal of thinking about how do we look at this more holistically and not separate, because I think that that's also problematic, right? Because it's all interconnected. And a lot of these actors end up in other agencies in, in these places. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and you, know, you, had, you had asked the question about um, sexual abuse in the juvenile facilities, which we oversee, we actually issued a substantial report last week or the week you know, before. So I'll, I'll, I'll read it. About I have questions. In, I'll follow up about that with you later. <laughs> we are we are not we we had not been that report is not focused on that issue, um, and I want to do a little more reading up on the lawsuit that you mentioned. Um, but certainly, we we try in in every situation where where it fits to to think about sort of citywide solutions. And certainly, one of the things I think we point out in our report is there are more parallels than you might have expected between the juvenile facilities and the adult facilities, which are obviously very unfortunate parallels. And, and so certainly we're open to thinking about this in a, in a broad way. Just for me, it's understanding that a lot of the work is always attached to budget. And so thinking about one, how do we work together to ensure that your agency is properly funded and also the support that you guys need because it is, it is important work. And I think now more than ever, because as we're seeing, sometimes the things that we're trying to get at in information isn't available because agencies aren't making it available. And so we need to make sure that agencies like yours is properly funded, so thank you. Yeah. Um, what type of evidence or information does DOC typically provide when they inform the DOI duty team that there's been an allegation of sexual abuse? And is it enough to make an informed decision about whether DOI should be handling the case? So, my, <clears throat> excuse me, my understanding is we are getting the complaint itself referred to us. Um, and at that point, DOC has not done an investigation. So what we do, and that's sort of by design because we're taking that first look in that first 24 hour period. What we're doing is really focus, therefore, on the, the complaint itself and what kind of information does it give us? Does it give us enough information to know sort of what video we might pull? Is there an officer name? Can we look through our system to see whether there were prior complaints? Um, we can also look and see, did, did the victim ever make a complaint um, previously if we have the victim's name? So we're, we're trying to see what inquiry can we make just based on the complaint? And if we can make some headway and there's sufficient facts for us to go and develop some more evidence, then generally, although it's, a, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and I described some of the other factors we consider, like the seriousness of the allegation, does it involve physical contact versus verbal harassment, which is not to say verbal harassment isn't serious, it's simply how are we gonna allocate our resources. We look at all of those things, and then if we can continue the investigation, if the complaint gives us sufficient information to do that, we generally will do that. If not, <clears throat> we will clear DOC to do an investigation. Um, and then, as, as I mentioned, to the extent that DOC develops evidence of criminality, they are obligated to refer that back to us so that we can pick up the investigation from there if we think that that's warranted. In your, um, thank you for that. In your opening statement, you said that when considering whether to retain a case for investigation, the agency considers factors such as whether detailed information was provided by DOC, whether the alleged abuser has been the subject of previous accusations, whether physical contact was alleged, as you just mentioned, and DOI's investigative resources at the time of the complaint. One of the factors considered is whether the alleged abuser has been the subject of previous accusations. Does, DO, does DOI rely on DOC to inform them if the subject of the complaint has, has faced previous accusations and, or is that information um, something your agency uh, tracks independently? 
Well, it will, it will, we, we may have and should have, given the nature of the reporting system under PREA, we should have any prior complaints of sexual abuse, and we maintain our own case management system where we file every complaint that comes in. So even if it was too vague, but it had, let's say it had an officer's name, but no other detail, we weren't able to follow up on it further, we would still have a record of that. We can always go back to DOC to confirm whether there's anything they know that we don't. Um, but we should, based on the reporting rules, we should have any allegation of sexual abuse, at least one that falls under PREA, against an officer. Uh, Council Member Peters, do you have any final questions? Okay. That's all our questions. Um, thank you so much for, for your um, answers, and we'd love to follow up with you um, and, and really would love to work with you to make sure we're able to make this a priority. It's clear that the executive of this city is not making it a priority. I mean, this is a person who talks about women as eye candy publicly, so I don't know how much that's connecting from the top, but this is, this is a, a council of mostly women. Like, we are here as a resource to protect other women, and we want to work with you, so let us know what it would cost, what you need to hire people up, what do you need? We wanna, we wanna make sure it happens. And thank you for being here. I appreciate that offer of support very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we are going to turn to public testimony. I'm going to read this scripted thing so we can all be on our best behavior. I'm gonna now open for public hearing, uh, the hearing for public testimony. I remind members of the public that this is a government proceeding and that decorum shall be observed at all times. As such, members of the public shall remain silent at all times. The witness tables reserved for people who wish to testify. No video recording or photography is allowed from the witness table. Further, members of the public may not present audio or video recordings as testimony, but may sub uh, submit transcripts of such recordings to the sergeant at arms for inclusion in the hearing record. If you wish to speak, at today's hearing, please fill out an appearance card with the sergeant at arms and wait to be recognized. When recognized, you will have two minutes to speak on the topic of the bills we are considering today. If you have a written statement or additional written testimony you wish to submit for the record, please provide a copy of that testimony to the sergeant at arms. You may also email written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov within 72 hours of this hearing. Audio and video recordings will not be accepted. We will be doing um, three minutes. Um, we're a smaller group today, so I will be somewhat generous, but not too generous. Um, if you're not on topic, I will ask you to stop. Okay, so our first panel will be Anna Cull, uh, Constantine Yalisa Vesky. So sorry if I'm butchering these names. Barbara Hamilton and Michael Klinger. And you can begin when ready. Just make sure the red dot is on so we can hear you. Chair Nurse, members of the Council, my name is Anna Cull, and I'm an attorney for the sexual abuse survivors, some of whom you've heard from today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the ongoing issue of sexual abuse within New York City prisons, particularly at the Rose M. Singer Center on Rikers Island. The abuse of incarcerated women has been perpetrated at Rikers by correctional officers with impunity for decades. Regrettably, the topic of staff on inmate sexual violence at Rikers is far from new. Indeed, this council has convened here on this topic and discussed proposed reforms and accountability measures in response to ongoing issues of sexual violence at this facility many times before. This council has long heard about the horrors on Rikers Island. These horrors have been brought to light through journalistic investigations, organizations, survivors through testimony, and public advocates 
who have all urged the New York City Department of Corrections to eliminate sexual abuse at Rosie's. For decades, the endemic of sexual violence at Rosie's has been well documented and well known. On November 23, 2023, the New York Adult Survivors Act opened a one-year window permitting sexual abuse survivors to file claims and seek legal redress against institutions and their abusers, no matter when those claims arose. Over 700 cases were filed under this act, alleging sexual violence at, at Rikers. These cases have shed light on the rampant sexual violence faced by women that have spanned for four decades. I represent over 200 of these survivors. And these women are the victims that this council has been asked to protect. These are the victims that the Department of Corrections had a duty to protect. These cases have brought forward chilling accounts of abuse by correctional officers. Individuals who are entrusted with the care and safety of those in their custody, but instead in exploited their power to commit unspeakable acts of sexual violence. Survivors today have courageously shared their stories. And if you were listening, they have revealed patterns of coercion, corruption, violence, and intimidation over four decades. What is even more troubling is that many of the officers implicated in these sex crimes in the cases that have been filed have continued to remain employed by the New York City Department of Corrections even after the lawsuits were filed. And it was not until the cases attracted media scrutiny and public outcry that did the Department of Corrections take any meaningful steps to address the allegations, including suspending or removing these officers. And despite what was said here today, there has been ample notice of these lawsuits. In fact, I personally provided it. I provided it to the law department, and I provided it through cooperation with the media to spread awareness of this ongoing, horrific problem. This delay in action resulted in one alleged accuser, uh, excuse me, abuser, in being arrested for raping a woman while off duty in Queens in April of this year. That rape could have been prevented if the Department of Corrections took the necessary steps after being put on notice of the allegations that my clients have personally made in these complaints. This delay in action sends a very distressing message that the safety of incarcerated women is secondary to preserving institutional reputation. And we cannot tolerate that. The sheer volume of cases and the subsequent inaction by the Department of Corrections points to a systemic issue that extends beyond a few bad actors, and it extends beyond those who we have identified in our cases. It demonstrates a deeply rooted culture within the Department of Corrections that has failed to hold perpetrators accountable, allowing abuse to persist in a system where power dynamics are already putting survivors at a severe disadvantage. The culture of impunity must end. The women who have suffered while in custody deserve justice, accountability, and meaningful reform. This council has a critical role to play in ensuring that all who are in Department of Corrections custody including the most vulnerable, are treated with dignity and respect. Survivors of this abuse must be compensated not only for the legacy of trauma they have endured, but for the failure of the system to protect them. I urge this council to press for comprehensive oversight and policy changes. I urge the Department of Investigations to launch a deeper investigation into what can only be considered a rogue organization. Thank you. Can you please wrap your testimony? I am. Thank you. 
I'll just end with, as an attorney representing sex abuse survivors by the thousands, systemic sexual violence does not exist without institutional tolerance. And that's what we need to combat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know that there's a lot to be said here. I just, I, I want to um, be fair to everyone. You're the first. So sometimes that allows a little bit more time. That's not going to be the, the general Thank you for um, that. way we're going to move forward. Thank you. Chair, nurse, and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the approximately 1,800 Slater Slater Shulman clients who are survivors of jail and prison sexual assault in New York. My name is Konstantin Yelisevetsky. I'm the managing attorney at Slater Slater Shulman in our New York City office, and I directly oversee the Adult Survivors Act, Adult Survivors Act cases. Our firm has filed on behalf of all these survivors, including 473 cases stemming out of Rikers. We are honored to represent Ms. Karen Kleins and Ms. Tasha Carter Beasley, two courageous survivors who bravely testified before this panel earlier. We are grateful that the Council is paying attention to this problem, even though it extends far beyond the borders of New York City. The pervasiveness of rampant and unchecked sexual assaults by in, of, of inmates by jail employees has been recognized and thoroughly documented throughout the U.S. correctional systems. In 2003, the U.S. Congress enacted the Prison Rape Elimination Act, or PREA, to establish national standards for preventing and responding to the sexual abuse of federal inmates. PREA requires a strict written policy mandating zero tolerance towards all forms of sexual abuse and sexual harassment and outlining an approach to preventing, detecting, and responding to such conduct. The City Department of Corrections has failed this mandate and failed the women that they were supposed to protect. These brave survivors of sexual assault were in jail serving sentences decided by our justice system or alternative, alter, alternatively awaiting a judicial hearing that would determine their fate. What they were given instead were life sentences of trauma. Earlier today, Chair Nurse, um, Council Member Stevens, um, Council Member Caban, who's no longer here, hit the nail on the head. There's a 5% substantiation rate when investigations are conducted. By definition, that means 95% of the survivors who are brave enough to report their sexual abuse are not believed. And people can sit here all day long and tell you that they believe survivors. When there's a 5% substantiation rate, by definition, that means they don't believe 95% of them. A 5% substantiation rate means that the system of investigating these allegations is either broken or fraudulent. There is no other explanation for why only 5% of allegations are substantiated. In addition to the typical evidence of these kinds of cases, including witnesses, we have clients who have been treated for sexually tra transmitted diseases, including HIV, which they contracted during their incarceration. We have other clients who were impregnated and had abortions or delivered a child, and the officer's name is on the birth certificate. I'm approaching the end. Multiple unrelated clients incarcerated at different times, including Ms. Kleins and including Ms. Carter Beasley, have reported assaults by the same guard indicating a pattern of repeated abuse and neglect. 18 of our clients at Rikers Island independently implicated a notorious DOC employee who went by the nickname Champagne. The Adult Survivors Act, sponsored by Senator Hoylman and Assemblymember Rosenthal, gave my firm and other firms the tool it needed to file cases, but our work, all of our work, is not done. There are many factors that deter individuals from filing lawsuits for sexual uh, crimes or reporting the, their own abuse. And incarcerated people face added barriers to justice, including retaliation by correctional staff. We need to reform and overhaul the practices and procedures that allow New York City jails to hire and retain abusers and to turn a blind eye when sexual assaults are reported. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon, Chair Nurse and members of the committee. 
Uh, my name is Barbara Hamilton. I am the Director of Incarcerated Client Services at the Legal Aid Society, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, as you know, Legal Aid is urging the City Council to act on this, and what I would say is it's time for a reckoning on this issue. Um, Legal Aid has represented and interviewed many people who are sexually abused, harassed, and assaulted in DOC custody. And what we found during our very long investigation is that there is a deep-seated culture where correctional staff explo exploit their authority with impunity. And despite repeated warnings to the city and the Department of Correction, um, there has been no attempt to meaningfully remedy the situation as we saw here today. The practices enacted by DOC fail to demonstrate any intent to actually and electively change the status quo. There is a failure to conduct meaningful and robust and timely investigations. A big issue is people being subject to retaliation for reporting. And allegations of sexual abuse against staff, as discussed today, are rarely substantiated. It was one half of a percent out of 1,500 cases. DOC, first and foremost, must comply with PREA, and Legal Aid will recommend independent audits inside PREA to make sure that the department is conforming. DOC must enact hiring processes that screen prospective correction officers. DOC must implement policies to protect people in custody who report sexual abuse from retaliation and to really meaningfully connect them with services. The city and DOC must conduct meaningful and timely investigations into allegations of sexual abuse. And we agree that DOC must adequately train its correction officers, supervisors, medical staff, and investigators to detect, report, and thoroughly investigate sexual abuse. To that end, Legal Aid supports Intro 830 2024. We do have suggestions to make the bill more robust. For example, we suggest having proficiency audits, enforcement and monitoring. The standard of proof for investigators should be clear, and they should use the PREA standard definition for sexual violence rather than the penal code definition. Individuals who report should be deemed credible until proven otherwise. Investigators should meaningfully look at previous reports, even if they were unsubstantiated against staff and the chronically extremely low rate of substantiation of abuse is unacceptable. Lastly, DOC must hold staff accountable as well as the city for abuse, retaliation, and sexual exploitation and assault in a meaningful and timely manner through the, informal, through the internal disciplinary processes as well as referrals for criminal prosecution. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Klinger. I'm a jail services attorney with Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, today's committee report expresses the committee's concern that the department might be undercounting or missing allegations of sexual abuse. We share your concern, and based on our client's experience, we know they are. The Adult Survivors Act has pulled back the curtain on a world of sexual abuse on Rikers Island that should shock us but it should not surprise us because we've long known about DOC's culture of brutality and abuse, not only through the reports of the Nunez Monitor, which focuses on violence in the jails, but also from a 2013 DOJ survey that found the Rose M. Singer Center to have one of the highest rates of reported sexual victimization by staff in the nation. At Brooklyn Defenders, when the people we represent share their experiences of sexual harassment and assault by staff on Rikers, they simultaneously say they are afraid to report it. They're afraid to report, not only out of fear of retaliation, but because of a fear of the investigatory process itself, um, a process that is both dangerous and, in their view, futile. The department is far from adequately performing its obligations under PREA. These failures are endemic, the consequences of a department culture that tolerates abuse and retribution against people in custody and fails to hold abusers accountable. 
In considering intro 830 today, we urge the council to think creatively of ways to designate an authority external to the department with responsibility for investigating allegations of sexual assault and abuse, as well as providing trainings related to pre implementation. The potential cost of the Adult Survivors Act claims, nearly $15 billion, is a frightening indication of the scope of the problem to date. And we cannot pretend to trust that this department is capable of creating conditions where our clients might ever feel safe enough to trust in a reporting system that has so far succeeded only in silencing them. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I don't, I don't think we have any questions. Appreciate you all coming down today and, and sharing and for you know, bringing clients with you. We appreciate it. Our next panel will be Yona Zietz, Zietz, Leah Faria, Dr. V, Christopher Leon Johnson. You don't want to testify? Okay. Whenever you're ready, you can begin. Thank you, Chair Nurse, um, and the other members of the committee. Oh, there you go. It just sounded like it was echoing. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Nurse, and the other members of the committee. Um, good afternoon, my name is Leah Faria, and I am the Director of Community Engagement at the Women's Community Justice Association. And I am here testifying on behalf of the Beyond Rosies campaign. As you know, under the Adult Survivors Act, over 700 women have reported serious sexual abuse at the Rosam Singer Center on Rikers Island, spanning nearly 50 years. Their allegations against the officers charged with their care range from coercion to violent rape. One would think that allegations on that scale would prompt some serious self-examination on the part of the city of New York, or at least a major investigation. Instead, the city has been sitting on their hands no outside, investigate, no, no outside investigative body has been appointed or funded. Guards accused of multiple assaults were pulled from their posts only following scathing media coverage. The picture this paints is not pretty. It is a picture of a culture where serial rape was taken for granted for decades and still isn't taken seriously enough because the victims were incarcerated women and its perpetrators wore badges. And, the, and that must change at every level of New York's government and carceral system. That the victims of these assaults were incarcerated at the time speaks volumes about their context. The vast power imbalance between correction officers and incarcerated people is ripe for abuse. Incarcerated people are effectively stripped of their bodily autonomy. They depend on correction officers for their most basic needs food, clothing, even access to the bathroom, and have no real means to remove themselves from dangerous or abusive situations within the jail. To report abuse is to court retaliation from people who control literally every aspect of their lives. This is a problem that runs deeper than a fat, few bad apples, although I want to emphasize, emphasize that one would be too many. This is about the inherent dehumanization of incarceration and the inevitable abuse of absolute power. It is about accountability, yes, but even more. It's about the injustice of placing people in a position of such total vulnerability to what amounts to an illusion of increased public safety. It would be easy to solely blame the culture of corrections or its leadership at the times of various assaults but the roots of this epidemic of sexual violence run far deeper. To confront it is a serious way required, in this serious way requires challenging the system of incarceration as a whole and to address it effectively requires the city at every level to prioritize both decarceration and a substantial change in the culture surrounding corrections. 
We applaud the concrete steps that have been taken, the introduction of intro 792 and 830, and this hearing itself are excellent starts. And as the new leadership at DOC, it seem, who seems to grasp the urgent need for system-wide change, we urge the council to adopt intro 792 and 830 and the Department of Corrections to seriously examine and challenge the factors that contributed to the culture of impunity around 50 years of sexual abuse and both bodies prioritize mass incarceration, especially for women and gender expansive people. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Nurse, um, for holding today's important committee hearing on preventing and addressing sexual assault and harassment in New York City jails. My name is Yona Zeitz, and I'm the Advocacy Director at the Catal Center for Equity, Health, and Justice. And our members are from all across the city, and they include people that have been incarcerated at Rikers, family members, of uh, people that are currently and formerly incarcerated at Rikers, and I think they all know too well how horrific Rikers really is and have experienced the harms many that were mentioned today throughout the hearing and are deeply concerned about the ongoing disaster unfolding in our city's jail system. And so we submit this testimony to bring your attention to the crisis at Rikers and the need to immediately shutter the notorious and deadly jail complex. Um, you know, New Yorkers across the city are deeply concerned with what's happening at Rikers and since Mayor Adams took office, the overlapping crises and scandals on Rikers um, and throughout his entire administration have only worsened. And uh, today's hearing is, is a great example of that. The administration has stymied the process of investigating sexual abuse cases um, with more than 45% of them going beyond the legal mandate. The number of su substantiated cases of sexual abuse decreased under this administration to 3.4% last year. So it's even below the 5% that the, the previous speech speaker just named. And, if 5% is abysmal, then 3.4% is even worse, and it's about half the national average, which is about 6% um, for substantiated claims of sexual abuse in correctional facilities. So this is absolutely unacceptable. You know, we've been horrible at this at a city, and it's only gotten worse under this current administration. Um, and along with, you know, the rampant sexual abuse at Rikers, violence is also out of control. At least 33 people have died in city jails under this administration. Um, and it's been clear that under this mayor, even the most basic aspects of operations at Rikers have further unraveled into disarray and avenues of accountability have been removed. Um, and so we support the bills today focused on increasing transparency, safeguards, and accountability at Rikers to prevent sexual abuse and to end the culture of impunity in the DOC. However, it's clear that the only solution is to shut down Rikers once and for all. Um, and that has to be at the forefront of all city policy. Um, and given the ongoing crises, more drastic measures are needed to address the longstanding issues plaguing the jail system to prevent further abuse, harm, and death to the people currently incarcerated there. Um, and that's why until Rikers is closed, we're calling for the federal courts to immediately intervene and, uh, and appoint an independent receiver to improve conditions and save lives. It's abundantly clear, and I think the testimony from the DOC made it even more clear that this administration and department is both unwilling and unable to address the deep-seated issues plaguing the jail system. And so there needs to be more drastic steps that are taken um, because it's clear that they're not willing to do it. Um, and so thank you for the time and appreciate this hearing today. All right, good afternoon. My name is Christopher Leon Johnson. Um, Sandy, like I said on Twitter, uh, I don't know, my, I lost some words about that situation you went through in Rikers. Nobody should go through that. Um, let's make that clear. Uh, let, me, let me say something. I know this is a different panel of what needs to be on. You'll be on the last one with the people that's against all the bills. But what we have to do is, uh, we have to refund the DOC. We have to refund the police. We have to uh, inter interject the sexual assault into domestic violence, into domestic violence, because once we get that, we can start funding these um, organizations more with domestic violence funding. Um, it, let me make this clear, right? Look, there's a lot of sexual assaults in these jails, like Rikers, 
I don't believe it should be closed because that's nothing but a land grab for the developers. But we need we got to start talking about in the city council, especially in this committee, about the female corrections officers that get sexually assaulted, the female employees of DOC that get that get sexually assaulted in the jails too. Yeah, there's a lot of inmates, of female inmates, and male inmates too that get sexually assaulted. But those, but the employees and the the corrections officers, they get left out of the equation, and. And what's going on, and I think is I don't think it's just you, Sandy. It's just a big, bigger thing in the whole with these nonprofits is that they just make they just want to make it all about inmates, inmates, inmates. Like they the only only the victims of sexual assault in these jails, which is yeah, they're not the only ones. There's other um, victims in these jails, like the like the the COs and the employees. But the going forward, to have the conversation go big wide is that you have to start. Um, recognizing these victims, such as the employees and the um, corrections officers, instead of just the inmates, because let's keep it real, there are inmates that are that shouldn't be there, and that's why y'all want this closed because there shouldn't guys shouldn't be there, but there's a certain amount of people that should be in Rikers that should be in these jails, and and I'm gonna make this clear, just um, closing down Rikers is not gonna fix this because you can close down records all you want. You have to jail these people somewhere and they're gonna build borough-based jails. So it's not gonna solve anything. Closing records will never solve um, ending the sexual assault pandemic in the New York City jail system. Um, like I said, is education, is uh, refunding our police, refunding the DOC, and, and since we're the last day of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, next year, hope next year that the city council adopts a resolution to add sexual assault and sexual harassment into the definition of domestic violence. So all these nonprofits can lock the funding, um, and the DOC can lock the funding to um, lock the funding to uh, start advocating more to protect these inmates and the employees from sexual assault. And we need to um, help out the DO DOI. And one more thing is the DOI needs to start investigating with Brad Lander. So that's it. Thank you. Peace and blessings, everyone. Can you hear me? First, I just want to acknowledge Chair Council Member Sandy Nurse. Thank you so much, and all the other council members. We got to give respect where respect is due. Peace and blessings, everyone, all chairs and council members. I'm Chaplain Dr. Victoria Phillips, AKA Dr. V. Today, I'm speaking from several volunteer and contractor positions. Today, there was over a million dollars in salaries at this very table, yet very few answers. Various levels were asked under one topic, yet few answers. So I'm just gonna address a few things. Blind spots, I've been asking and actually speaking and advocating about this for, since 2012. Myself and others have fought and have gotten over 14,000 cameras on Rikers Island, but it's not enough. I will say, this commissioner has been patrolling the jails often and even has leadership doing so. Still, unfortunately, it's not enough to shift the old school jailing, actual lawlessness that occurs, nor the inhumane culture. So let's be clear, one out of four women go into Rosie's already being a survivor of sexual assault. When we speak of trauma, who are we incarcerating? I testified before this committee when Councilmember Powell was chair and asked for an increase in DOI, and I asked for an increase in officers because they were working 24 hours around the clock back then. And I asked for an increase in funding for programming. In the past, DOI has actually been guilty of holding up cases until someone has moved, been transferred, or released. Quite frankly, they themselves meet their own level of accountability. Today, the commissioner mentioned 19 investigators have 25 cases equally. That adds up to 475, but over 700 cases still need to be needs to be investigated. The commissioner says she needs at least 14 more. So at 25 cases, that would be about, they could cover 350 cases. That will cover the 700 backlog and leave space to investigate cases in real time. Let's give it to them so we can truly hold them accountable. Accountability must begin to be real. When DOC says they respond in 2012 to 24 hours after an allegation has occurred, that's a lie. I know for a fact this year alone, I know for a fact this year alone, 
DOC union has referred an officer to me after being sexually assaulted in a facility, caught on tape. The officer was suspended, but not because of the allegation. He was suspended because he was caught drinking on duty. Um, the investigators didn't even respond to that officer until after 20 days, and that was when I reached out to head leadership at DOC to see what was going on. I'm saying that because if that is what's happening to an officer, what's happening to a detainee? And now when we talk about accountability this year alone, I myself was threatened by an officer at BOC after testifying in the same room. And I'm saying it here because the chair of the Board of Corrections Oversight actually told me he saw what happened, that the president of the union would have to take care of that officer. I had to testify three months, four more times on the record and do my own due diligence to make sure that officer no longer can threaten me or anybody else. But again, what happens behind the walls when someone puts a grievance in? If my grievance is disrespected and ignored on the outside, what is happening to those who need us to do our jobs and speak for them? And when we talk about accountability, it has to be something that is real because everybody's not as strong as me and even us strong ones need support and backup. I didn't have nobody standing up for me, but my God my, and my ancestors, and I was able to fight for myself. But when I leave people behind the walls who cry and beg me for help and I can't save them, I'm asking you to try and join this fight to save them. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Thank you all for testifying. Thank you. Okay, that is it today. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna call one person. Uh, Kelly Grace Price, if you're on the Zoom, let yourself be known. You are not on the Zoom. Okay, well thank you, thank you to the staff. Thank you, Jeremy and Natalie, um, for holding this down and all the work you've put into it. Thank you, Council Member Stevens, for hanging out and staying, <laughs> and staying tough. This is the end of the hearing.